We are stepping into 2023. Students, college grads and professionals are actively looking for a brighter career and brilliant career transition into software development. Yet, there's one question that needs to be answered. Which programming language to choose? The answer is Java. Java is the only programming language that spread its roots into almost everything. From designing software to the entire software development framework, from designing a database to a complete cloud platform, from a simple mobile application to a fully fledged operating system, Java is everywhere. What better than choosing a triad, tested and well established programming language? You are already watching Simply Learn and we bring you the complete Core Java course. In the Core Java tutorial, you will learn the following. A brief introduction to Java, where you learn a brief history and the fundamentals of Java programming that covers data types, variables, loops and conditional statements. Post that, you will learn to develop your first Java program. Once you understand the basics better, we can escalate to the next level, where you will learn data structures in Java. Post that, you will learn the Java collections. Finally, you learn the object-oriented paradigms in Java, where you will be introduced to abstraction, encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism in Java. Throughout this session, the programming technicalities will be covered in theoretical and practical ways to deliver the best learning experience. Now, over to our training experts. Hello guys, this is Vikesh, and let's get started with the first topic of this series, which is about introduction to Java. So when we talk about Java, it is one of the most popular programming language out there. And it was created way back in 1991, but it was publicly released only in 1995. It was developed by one of the famous developers of our generation, who is James Gosling at Sun Microsystems. And then later Java was acquired by Oracle and today Oracle owns Java. Java is very simple and easy to use and we will look at different aspects of how it is easy and simple to use. It's a write once run anywhere type of programming language. Again, we will look at details into, into, into this particular concept as well. And when we talk about the usage of Java, you can use it to build web applications, mobile applications, desktop applications, even command line applications. And at the same time, you can also use it to build complex applications like gaming applications, building microservices or building distributed computing, etc. Let's talk about the features of Java. So one of the most prominent features of Java is that it's an object oriented programming language, which means that everything which happens in Java happens around objects. Objects enable the execution of the program. Objects talk to each other to exchange data and messages. We will look at, look at the concept of objects in details in the upcoming lectures. It's a platform independent language, which means that uh, again, going back to the previous point of write once run anywhere, uh, it basically enables the program to be run on any platform once compiled. So once you have prepared your program and you have compiled your program, then your compiled program can be run on any platform. It is a strong type checking language, which means that it will force you to respect the contracts of the variables to the data types. For example, if you have created a collection which should accept strings, then you can only insert strings in that collection and it will not allow you to add an, a number or an integer into that collection. So it's a strongly type checking language. So when you run your program, it's a two step process in Java. You compile the program and then you, then you execute the program, which we also call as interpretation. So you have a Java compiler and you have a Java interpreter. You first compile your program and then you run the program using the help of Java interpreter. Java also provides automatic garbage collection. It's a really important feature. And if you talk about the languages prior to Java, like C or C++, they did not offer this capability. And this capability made Java really popular because it could automatically find the unused objects and variables and remove them from the memory to free up memory space for the program execution. It also provides multi-threading support, which means that you can build multi-threading applications like a gaming application. If you take the example of a racing game, for example, so there's, there, there can be one thread which is monitoring your leaderboard score. There can be another thread which is displaying the speed of the car. There can be another thread which is displaying the graphic. 
there can be another thread which is displaying the sound. So you see all of these threads are working parallelly and Java provides the support to create such applications using the multi-threading capability it has. Java is secure by default because there are no pointers in Java. So there are no possibilities of having any memory leaks or any reference leaks from the application. Again, if you take the example of uh, programming languages like C or C++, you had the concept of pointers and we, we witnessed a lot, of, uh, a lot of scenarios and a lot of incidents where there was a memory leakage happening in the, in the production application, which was, which was really a bad experience for the organizations. So Java removed the concept of pointers totally from its programming language. It's also a very robust language because it provides a really great exception handling framework out of the box, which developers can use and implement to build really resilient applications. So now let us understand how a Java program is run. So at first you basically write your Java program and you store your Java program into a .java file. Then you compile your Java file with the help of the Java compiler. Once the program is compiled, the compiler is going to generate another file, which is a .class file. And this .class file is basically the compiled file or also known as the bytecode file. So this bytecode or the, the .class file code can be run on any platform, be it a Linux platform or a Windows platform or a Mac OS platform or any other platform. To give you some more context, the first two steps where you write your Java program and you compile your Java program can be run on any machine. Let's take the example that you ran these two steps on a Windows machine. So you ran your, uh, you write your program and you compile your program on a Windows machine, which generated a .class file. Then you transported this .class file to a Linux machine and it also worked there. You transported your .class file to a Mac OS machine and it worked there as well. And that's what brings the platform independence concept of Java that you can write the program once on any platform. And once you have the bytecode available, then you can run this program on any other platform of your choice. Okay, so that was about how the Java program execution works and how the platform independence is actually achieved. Now, uh, let us spend some time to understand the anatomy of Java. So once you download Java and install Java on your local machine, you will hear the term JDK. Actually, if you will see that in the next lecture that when you try to download the Java, it will say JDK download. JDK stands for Java Development Kit. So the Java Development Kit is the installation of the Java. This is what you're going to install on your machine. Once the JDK or Java Development Kit has been installed, the JDK will provide a lot of other components as well, like Java Runtime Environment or JRE, Java Virtual Machine or JVM, some class libraries and some other supporting libraries. So let us understand what happens when your program is run and how these components work together to make sure that your program runs as expected. Let's start from here. So you install JDK or the Java Development Kit. You write your program and then you compile your program with the help of Java compiler, which is provided by JDK. Once the program is compiled, your .class file will be generated and then you can uh, run that .class file using JRE. In fact, if you just run your program on your local machine, JRE will automatically kick in and run your .class file. So the Java runtime environment or JRE runs your .class file with the help of these three components. Let's talk about first component, which is Java Virtual Machine or JVM. So the Java Virtual Machine is actually the virtual environment inside which your program runs. This is the real main environment inside your .class file is running. So when, uh, when this program is running, how does it achieve this environment? For achieving this virtual, virtual machine environment, it would need some runtime libraries. And that is provided by these class libraries. For example, there would be a runtime jar or rt.jar as a shorthand which will be supplied to the program at the runtime to make sure that the program runs smoothly. Then there are other supporting libraries as well, which your program may be using. For example, if this program, this dot class file is, let's say a calculator program, then it might be using uh, a square root function from java.math package 
So how do how does the java.math package get supplied at runtime? It would be supplied by the other supporting libraries which are present inside GRE. So GRE will make sure that your program runs inside the Java virtual machine. It gets the required runtime libraries and it also gets the libraries which are referred in your program at runtime. And this all together will make sure that your program is running. So you can see JDK basically uh, provides GRE automatically and JVM automatically, but you can also install GRE separately. If you talk about that use case where you compile your program on a Windows machine using JDK and then you exported your dot class file to another machine and there you just install the GRE. You don't install JDK there, you just install the runtime environment and you can run the dot class file just using the runtime environment. And that brings us to the end of this lecture. Let's get started with installing Java. We will basically look at how we can install Java on a Windows machine. So the first step to install Java is to download it from the official Oracle website. So for that, let's open a web browser and let's type JDK Java download and hit enter. Then you need to find the link which says oracle.com because like we discussed in the previous lecture, uh, Java is owned by Oracle. So we need to download it from the official website only. So we can click on this link which says Java SE downloads. It will bring us to the downloads page and we will see different versions of Java. You can see the Java SE 15, you can see Java SE 14, you can also see Java SE 11 and all the previous versions. Another, another thing which you will notice that it says LTS here, which means long-term support. Basically long-term support are the releases for which Oracle is going to provide uh, long-term security patches and updates. For the non-LTS releases, Java will not provide long-term support and long-term patch fixes and long-term security fixes. So it's a good idea to analyze and evaluate on which version you want to develop your applications on. For this demo, I think it is fine. We can go with the non-LTS version. And even for your, uh, for your customer facing applications, you can start with the non-LTS version and then upgrade to the latest LTS version whenever that is available. So for this demo, we can download Java SE 15 and you can also do the same on your machine. It will work exactly the same way as an LTS works. So you can click on the JDK download option here. Let's click on that. It is going to bring up the downloads detail page and you can see uh, there are multiple options given here uh, in terms of what platform you want to install Java on whether it is a Linux platform or it is a Mac OS machine or it is a Windows platform. So like I said in the beginning of the demo that today we are going to see how we can install this on a Windows machine. So I'm going to download the Windows X64 installer here. If you are working on a Linux machine or a Mac OS machine, you can download those respective installers as well. So you can see the exe here. So let's click on this. Once we click on this, we'll get this pop-up, which will ask us to accept the Oracle Technology Network License Agreement. So we can hit this checkbox and click on download JDK 15. And this shall start the download and you will see some, some EXE getting downloaded in, uh, in your download box here. But as the download is going to take some time and uh, I'm not going to wait for that. And that's the reason I have already downloaded the JDK 15 for this particular demo. And that JDK is, is sitting here on my desktop, which I've downloaded pri prior to this demo. So we'll just run this particular EXE, which is exactly the same EXE as the one which is being downloaded. So let us double click on this. It will ask you for this pop-up in some cases. So you can just hit yes. Basically it is asking whether you trust this EXE or not. But as we downloaded this from official Oracle website, then we can trust this particular EXE. So I will hit yes. And now the installer is going to unpack and you might get a screen like this, which will be an installation wizard for the Java SE development kit 15. Another thing which before I proceed, I just wanted to highlight that as well, that you might have noticed the word JDK here. It's exactly the same term which we covered in the last lecture that when you install Java, you basically install the JDK, which is the Java development kit. And this is also visible here when it says Java SE development kit 15. So let's hit next. Then on this particular page, you have the option to change the installation location of Java if you want to. 
by default it is going to install in c program files slash java slash jdk 15 but if you want to change the location and you want to install java to a particular custom location of your choice that is also possible you just hit change here and then you can choose whatever directory or folder or place you want to install this uh, java on and you can uh, basically select the appropriate location for this particular case i don't want to change that i'm happy with the default location which is available here so i'm just going to proceed with this particular location here so I'll, i will just hit next and then java is going to install and it's it's very fast installation it generally takes few seconds as you will see in this demo basically it is going to unpack all the all the libraries and all the runtime libraries and all the class path libraries which we discussed in the previous lecture and put all that into the location which we specified to install java it will also set up the rest of the prerequisites which are required to run java successfully so looks like the java has been successfully installed as is visible in this message and there's also a next step if you want to uh, access the tutorials or the api documentations the developer guides the release notes etc i don't want to do that so i will just hit close here and now if we want to just verify if java is uh, is installed or not then we can in, uh, verify that from the command line prompt let me just exit this and let's go to the command prompt to verify to see if java has been successfully installed so to do that uh, we'll we'll just open the search bar and we'll type cmd it is going to show us this command prompt here we'll click on this and it will open the command prompt for you like it has opened for me and there you just need to type java hyphen version and you hit enter if you get a message like this it means java has been successfully installed if you get a message saying that java is not recognized as a command it means that java is still not successfully installed and something has gone wrong in your installation and in that case you might want to restart you might want to go back and reinstall this java exe again so in this case it looks like it has been successfully installed and we can also get some interesting information from here we can see which version of java has been installed it says java version 15 we can also see that the jre is also installed the java se runtime environment or jre is also installed and we can also see that the jvm is also installed which is java hotspot server vm vm means the virtual machine so if i connect this back to the previous lecture we can see that uh, the, the java jdk basically installed the jre as well as the jvm as well and the complete java package has been successfully installed now we are ready to use java uh, a java program and run java programs on this machine and at this step i would like to conclude this lecture in the next session we will be discussing how we can install eclipse because that would be the natural next step for any java developer that they want to install java and then they want to install eclipse and start working let's get started with installing eclipse on a windows machine so the first thing which we need to do is to download eclipse so for that i'm just going to open my web browser and type eclipse download press enter and then you need to find the link which says eclipse.org slash downloads which is the first link in my search results you can also see it says eclipse downloads the eclipse foundation and eclipse foundation is the is the organization which maintains the eclipse installers so we can click on this once we click on this we will be redirected onto the eclipse downloads page and there again you will see bunch of options you will see the default option highlighted which would be the eclipse installer for uh, uh, for jre for mac os windows and linux and then you have some other tool platforms option as well like eclipse g or orion which you might want to use for advanced cases but for running java applications all you need is an eclipse installer which is coming from here so based on your machine eclipse will automatically detect whether you want a 64 bit installer or a 32 bit installer and you can just click on this particular link which says download 64 bit here so i'm just going to hit download 64 bit it is going to open this particular screen where based on your current location eclipse will suggest the nearest possible distribution mirror distribution mirror is basically a server which is present somewhere uh, in this world which contains this eclipse installer exe 
and eclipse has created these servers all across the globes these servers are basically called the mirrors and based on your current location which will be deducted taken taken from your isp from the internet ip address from which you are accessing this particular website so based on your isp location it is going to suggest you the nearest possible mirror location so that your download is the fastest so in my case the nearest location is netherlands here as you can see and i get a download option this is the file name which says eclipse installer jre windows 64.exe and if you think that this mirror doesn't make sense just click on this option select another mirror and then you can choose another mirror but generally it works really well it works based on it works based on your ip location and and it's generally uh, the download speed is pretty good based on the suggested mirror so i'm not going to change the mirror location because i think this works fine for me so and i'm just going to click on this particular button which is going to start the download of the eclipse installer so now i have i have hit the download button and you can see right now an exe has been download uh, has begun to download uh, it is going to again take some time and uh, I have already downloaded this particular exe just to save us some time and I'm going to use that exe to showcase how we can install it. Another thing just wanted to highlight is that Eclipse is an open source organization. It works on donations. So if you feel generous about it and if you feel that Eclipse is doing really great work, you can also donate to it, which we'll show here. So we can move to the next step, which is about installing. So you can see here I have an installer here an exe file basically which i have pre-downloaded to showcase this demo i'm just going to double click on this and it is going to unpack the installer you can see this uh, this icon will be presented to you which says eclipse installer by oomph oomph is basically the provider for this particular installer who manages the installer and based on your computer's capacity and speed it is going to take few seconds and in the background what it is doing is basically it is unpacking this installer and creating all the installation files which it needs to successfully install it on your computer once that is done you will be presented with this kind of screen and you will see that eclipse provides multiple different kind of ides for different set of developer communities you will see an option which says eclipse ide for java developers you will also see eclipse ide for enterprise java developers you will see the ide for c plus plus and c developers web and javascript php Eclipse committers who basically contribute to the Eclipse organization or uh, RCP, RAP, tester, scientific computing. There are tons of IDEs which Eclipse maintains. For our use case throughout this series, I think we will be focusing on this particular IDE which says Eclipse IDE for enterprise Java developers. You can also use this particular IDE, but this is a very bare bone IDE with very limited set of integrations. Like it says, it includes a Java IDE, a Git client, an XML editor, a Maven plugin, and a Gradle plugin. But if you look at the enterprise, you will get more integrations. You can use this particular IDE to work on whatever you work here. So these all will work here. But in addition, you can also use this IDE to build a web application, build a web service, build a JPA application, data tools, Java server pages, faces, etc. So this is more, uh, more advanced, I would say. And we will go with this particular IDE. And uh, you can also choose this ID if you want to, but for this demo, we are going to choose this one. I will click on this, then it is going to show me which virtual machine it is going to use. So if you remember in the previous lecture, we installed Java 15. It has automatically detected that location by reading my C program files folder, and it has automatically taken that. If you have multiple JDK installations on your machine, you can click on this icon and change a different Java virtual machine. I'm going to leave it as is. Again, the installation folder is also by default taken to your C users username slash Eclipse slash the JEE uh, version number. And again, if you want to change this, you can also change a different installation folder. I'm going to leave everything as default. It will automatically create a start menu entry and a desktop shortcut. And now I hit install. It might come uh, ask you for a, a user agreement. So you can hit accept now. And now it has begun the installation. The installation generally takes a bit of time to complete in some cases. So again, it depends upon your in your in your computer's uh, capacity and uh, speed. Basically, if it's a good robust machine with uh, with good capacity, the installation might be very fast, as you can see in my computer. And if you have uh, a computer which is not very strong on configurations, 
you can just be patient and wait for some time and the installation will be finished once the installation is finished you will see this launch option here you will also has, have an option to keep an installer if you want to show the readme file but i think the the main option here which we are going to use is the launch option so if you hit the launch option now the actual ide is going to start up it's again going to set up some configuration files and some bootstrap configuration files which it needs to and then it will ask you to choose a workspace again the workspace is up to you where do you where you want to create your workspace the workspace is basically the location where you uh, you will create your projects it will store those project files and the source code of those projects so it is up to you where you want to create it again i'm going to leave it as default here but if you want to change it just hit browse here and choose whatever location you want to you can see you can choose you can go to pc and you can choose whatever location you want to i'm going to leave it as is and you also have a choice that you don't want eclipse to ask this every time so you can check this box and next time eclipse is not going to ask you to choose a directory as workspace and every time you start eclipse it will automatically go to this particular directory so you can either check it or uncheck it based on your convenience and hit launch once you hit launch it is going to start the actual ide as a desktop application and you will get a nice interface and a welcome screen from eclipse which will which will basically show the basic uh, overview of the screen something like this so now you can see that the eclipse ide has started it has a welcome page which has multiple options you can check out a project from git you can import an existing project you can go to the marketplace create a java web project or whatever or you can just close this you have a nice navigation project uh, uh, project explorer bar here so all the projects which you are going to create will be listed here there are also some quick shortcuts here for creating different kind of projects and if you don't want to use that just go to file new and choose a kind of project you want to create whether it is a maven project or enterprise application project or dynamic web project or just a project if you just hit just a project you can ch choose a basic java project to start with click next give a project name let's call it test demo you can choose an execution environment here the, the jre and currently this particular ide has support up to 14 but i think this is going to work fine we don't need to worry about it we can also use a project specific jre like in this case java 15 which is the current installation so i can use this option because i want to use java 15 uh, environment because i have java 15 installed uh, so you can basically choose whatever option you want to choose it gives you a flexibility in terms of choosing the jre whether you want to choose an external jre whether you want to choose a project specific jre or you want to use the default jre jdk installation so you can use this option as well if you want to project layout is create either you want to create separate folders for source and classes or you want to create the uh, use the project folder again this is these are just basic configurations which you can uh, play around with if you want to i'm just going to leave it as is and hit next and then it is going to just give me a review screen here if i want to change anything i can otherwise i can just hit finish i can create a module name here if i want to but i don't want to create it so I just hit on uh, don't create and open the java perspective and that's it you have a java project here where you can create your java uh, files under this src and you can start executing those files we will look out uh, on those details in the upcoming lectures but for this lecture uh, i think this is what we wanted to achieve we wanted to show how we can install eclipse and how we can create a very sa sample uh, java cli project so this is it for this uh, this session in the next session we will look at some of the data types in java let's get started with primitive data types in java we are going to learn about the primitive data types in java and we'll also see a short demonstration of it so let's get started let's first just learn about those uh, data types i've just opened the official oracle documentation and don't worry if you see how this link appears here you can just open a browser window and just type java primitive data types and if you hit enter the first link which you will be given is this particular link and this is the same link which i have opened so let's learn about the data types now so java has uh, these primitive data types which you can see here some of them store numbers some of them store boolean values and some of them store characters so the data types which store numbers are byte short int long float and double these six data types basically are used to store any kind of numeric value let's understand these a bit more 
byte is the shortest possible data type value which you can use in java to store numbers you can only store numbers within the, within the range of minus 128 to plus 127 so you can see the range is very small and java has created this variable for use cases where you want to store numbers which have very small value in this range why do we provide these kind of options just to save memory because the smaller data type will require less memory to be used in the java program similarly the next bigger data type is short which is a bit bigger than byte and the range of this particular data type variables will range from minus 32678 to plus 32767 so that is the range for this particular variable and you can see that it has a it has a very big range as compared to the byte data type so if you want to store very uh, values which lie in this range you can use short the next one is int data type you can use this one to store even larger values which range from minus 2 raised to power 31 to plus 2 raised to power 31 minus 1. the next one is long which is even bigger than int and it can be used to store the values within the range of minus 2 raised to power 63 to plus 2 raised to power 63 minus 1. so as you can see as we go from top to bottom from byte to long the size of the value which can be stored using this data type increases and that's how you will basically take a decision of whether you want to use byte or you want to use short or int or long based on what size of the value that variable is going to contain then the next ones are float and double these two have been created for the use cases where, the, where you want to store the values numeric values which have decimals which are precision values i should also mention that byte short int and long are only used for storing absolute numbers which do not have any decimal representation even if you try to store a decimal value in these variables they will automatically be trimmed the decimal values will automatically be removed and you will only be shown the absolute values and in case of float and double they can maintain those precision and decimal values so we use float for the use cases where you want to store decimal representations of the values and you can see that the float value can store uh, a smaller precision value but double can store even a bigger precision value so if you have really big precision values to be maintained very big decimal values to be maintained you should use double and the float is used for storing a bit smaller size of the precision values i mean its range of values basically beyond the scope of this discussion if you want to read more about this you can go to this particular links which will explain this in detail but the basic idea is that float is good for storing two precision values and if you want to go beyond that you want to use double in some cases uh, some people also use float to store even beyond two values as well so it completely depends the main the decision factor is how long the value you are going to store in the decimal and that will take the decide whether you want to use float or double the next one is boolean which is used for storing the boolean values boolean values can be either true or false so there are only two possible values and then we have char which is used for storing characters it is uh, using 16 bit to store the value and this is a very popular java question for beginner level programmers that uh, why does it store uh, need 16 bit to store the character it's because it stores a unicode representation Unicode representation is a representation which can be accepted across platforms across the world in different character encodings. So let's move on to Eclipse now where I have prepared a very short and simple demo. I'm just creating a variable for each data type and I'm printing them. You also see some things here like the, these keywords and don't worry about these keywords. I will cover these keywords in detail in the upcoming lectures. You also see this and you can just for now you can remember that system.out.println is used for printing anything in java anything you want to print on the console you would be using system.out.println what is system what is out and what is println again we will cover these in the uh, upcoming lectures for now i'm just creating a bunch of data types here variables here basically i'm creating a cat type variable a byte type variable a short type variable an int type variable a float type variable a double and a boolean the way you create variables is basically you put the data type name 
you put the variable name which can be anything you put an equal sign and you put the value actual value which this variable is going to store and i've done the similar thing for all of these uh, 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 variables java wants semicolons to be there when you write your statements so please remember that your statements always end with semicolons so i've declared all of these variables here a byte a short an int float double and boolean and then i'm printing all of them basically here i'm printing the char variable here i'm printing the byte variable here i'm printing the short and so on and so forth so how do we actually run this application or this program we just double click on this or right click on this you go to this run as option you see this run as java application option so you can hit this option it will run the application and it will present all the output here in the console tab let me just bring this up so you can see all the variables have been printed here and this is coming from these print statements like i said this is used system.out.println is used to basically print anything and i've used that to print all the variables here first i'm printing the char variable whose value is a then i'm using the byte variable which is denoted by b and whose value is 2 so you can see the value is 2 here then i'm printing the third variable which is c which is a short type variable which has a value 22 you can see short and this is coming here the next print statement is int so you can see int here with the value 45 and this value is coming from here then we have float you can see the float value being printed here and you can see the float value declared here you also see an f here and this is the standard naming convention which java proposes that whenever you declare float and double you end them with f or d based on whether it is float or it is double then you see the double value which is having which is having a bigger precision than float so i have printed the double value using this particular print statement which is printed here and then we have the boolean value which is stored as g and the value of g is true and the same value is printed here so whatever i write here basically is printed here this is just a placeholder and this is the actual value so you can see that we are able to use all the variables here all the primitive variables basically which range from byte character byte short int float double and boolean and that's it for this session in the next session we will be discussing about the non primitive data types in java let's get started with non primitive data types in java in the previous lecture we talked about the primitive data types and now we'll discuss about some of the data types which are not primitive first of all let's understand what is the difference between primitive and non primitive so the primitive data types are the ones which are by default supported by java and non primitives are the one which are a bit custom in nature where you as developer have the liberty to define the nature of that data type we'll look at some examples of that as well but when we talk about which all are the non primitive data types we broadly talk about arrays we talk about classes we talk about strings as well and we will cover some of them in today's lecture and we have the a detailed lecture upcoming about the classes as well in fact in the in the uh, after few lectures we'll we'll cover how we'll create classes as well but for today's lecture we are going to focus on string data type and array data type and like i said for classes we have a dedicated uh, lecture upcoming so don't worry about that and again for this particular case as well i have already prepared a demo for this and we'll basically do some uh, look at some hands on examples to see how do we create these variables what these what does these variables mean and the first non primitive data type we are going to talk about is string and before i go on further i should also mention that it's very debatable in the java community to call string as a non primitive data type and actually technically speaking string is a special data type it neither fully lies in the primitive category nor it fully lies in the non primitive categories i'm covering this as a, as a non primitive data type because it's a bit inclined towards the non primitive category uh, why do we uh, do this is because java does provide native support for string handling in the jdk and that's the reason some of the developers feel that string is a primitive data type which is primitively supported by java but at the same time string is so customizable and it's so special in nature it's the way it stores the value the way it provides the operations and handlings 
it's so different than primitive data types that it cannot fully be put in the same bucket as the primitive data types. So that's why I said it's, it's a special data type, a bit inclined towards the non-primitive category. So what is string basically? We covered about the char data type in the previous lecture. And in char data type, you can only store a single character, right? But if you want to store a complete name of somebody, then it's a list of character. It's basically a lot of characters together. Then in that case, you would need a data type to store that continuous sequence of characters. And that's what string does. String can store a continuous sequence of characters. Technically, string is basically a character array. You can call string as a character array. And don't worry if you don't understand about the word array. I will explain that in the same lecture. So basically, it stores the continuous sequence of characters. That's how, that's how we define string. And you see this string. This is a basically the keyword, the data type basically in Java. So whenever you want to create a string, you need to write string with S capital. You need to give a name to the string. This can be anything. And then you can provide the value, which is which this particular string is going to contain. So you can see this is a continuous sequence of characters. T, E, S, T are the four characters which this string is going to contain. And after that, again, I'm printing this particular value. And like I said, don't worry about this. We'll cover this when we'll, when we'll write our first program in Java. So this is just to print the string value. I'm just putting a string placeholder here, and then I'm actually printing the, printing the values of the string variable. Now, string can be created in multiple ways in Java. This is one way of creating it. There's another way of creating a string variable, which is this one, which says, again, the string data type, some variable name, a keyword called new. Again, don't worry about what is this new keyword. We'll cover this when we'll talk about our running our first program in Java and writing the first program from scratch. Then we again say string, and then we provide the value. So if I compare this line number four to line number seven, you can see the difference is that I'm still storing the same value test, but the difference is that here there is no new string keyword, but here we have this new string keyword. So what is the difference? The difference is this, that in this case, in this particular case, string is going to reuse the same object multiple times. But in this case, every time you call this, it is going to create a new object. Again, what is object? It's just, you can think of it as, for now, you can think of it as a memory block. We'll again cover objects in details. But these are two different ways in which you can create string. This is generally the most popular way of doing it because this is memory efficient, because you can reuse the same variable again and again. So I'm creating the string variable here and creating another string variable, str1 here, and printing both of them. Then I've created this strange looking thing here, which is basically an array. Array, like I said, is a, also an, a, a non-primitive data type in Java. And array can store a continuous sequence of anything. That anything can be a number. That anything can be characters. That anything can be a, a, a floating number as well. So basic idea is that if you want to store a collection or a or sequence of multiple, multiple uh, uh, values, how do you do that? You do that with the help of arrays. Array is a data structure, a non-primitive data structure in Java, which can store a lot of values of similar type. We also call it as homogeneous data structure which, because it can only store same data type values or homogeneous data type values. So the, the biggest way to identify array is this square bracket. Whenever you see this square bracket in Java, it means it's an, it's an array variable. So here I am creating an integer array variable with the name ARR. This is the name of this particular array. It is only going to store integer values because I've specified int. And the moment I provide the square brackets, it's mean, it means that it is an array. So you can declare an array like this, and then you need to assign a size to the array. Size is basically denoting how many values this data structure is going to store. So I'm saying new, again, it's a keyword, and I'm saying that, okay, create a, a memory block for storing two integers. So this particular array ARR can store at max two values, two values at continuous locations. The next thing about array is that it stores the value in a zero index based location. So like I said, it can store two values. So the first location will always be array of zero. And this is how you specify the location or index 
of the element which is going to be stored. So at the zeroth location of this array, I'm storing zero. The first location of the array, I'm storing one. And this is just to show an error scenario, but I will just comment this for now. You can just put double slashes and comment any line. So I'm just storing, uh, filling up this array for two values. And the two values location would be zero index and first index. These are just continuous memory locations. And we denote those memory locations as zero and one. Array indexes always start with zero. And I'm just putting some values here. You can put any values. And then I'm printing the whole array. And I'm also printing the first value of the array. And we'll see how this pans out. And we'll also see how we can change this. So now we are going to run this application. So I'll just go to run as and click on run as Java application. And once I hit that, I get this output here. So let's understand this output. The first one is I'm just printing the string, which has the value test. And you can see it has printed here. It is coming from this line. Then the next line which is printed is line number eight, where I'm saying another string str1. And str1 also had the same value. So you can see another string has the same value. And then I have printed the array here, the complete array. And you see this strange value here. It also tells us that if you want to print the array, then you cannot just put the variable name and print it. The reason is because this is a non-primitive data type. And once you do this, it is basically printing the memory footprint of this array, the whole memory location where this array is stored. That's why you see this strange looking number, which is the memory hash code. And if you want to print any particular value, or any particular element inside this array, then you can do that by providing the index location of that element. So here I've said that print the zeroth location element of the array. The zeroth location array uh, element of the array was zero. So you can see the value zero here. Let me put some other value just to just for fun and show you how this works. So I've just changed the values. And now let's see what do we get for array zero. You can see now I get value three because now the, at the zeroth location, the three value is being stored and that is what, what is being printed here. We can also print the first value. I'll just go run as Java application. You can see now the array of first index is being stored, which is basically technically the second element of the array. But because array always works on a zero index based value uh, format, that's why when we say array one, the second element is printed. When I say array zero, the first element is printed. So always remember that array is a zero index based collection or data structure basically. What happens if I do this? Now there is no third element in this array because the array has the size only of two elements. And when I say ARR of two, which means I'm trying to print the third element in this array, which does not exist. So let's see what happens in that case. I get an exception. Exception is basically an error. I get an error saying that index two is out of bounds for length two. It means that the array length was actually two and index two does not exist. Remember it's saying index two, not the element two. Index two doesn't exist because only index zero and index one exist. This makes two elements and the actual size is also two. It does not have capacity to store third element. It does not have third element location anywhere. That's why it complains that you are trying to print a non-existing value. So this is where I would like to conclude my lecture about the non-primitive data types. So we covered about string, we covered arrays, and like I said, we'll cover classes in the upcoming lecture as well. Uh, in the next session, we are going to talk about tokens in Java. Let's get started with tokens in Java. When we talk about tokens in Java, these tokens are basically some reserved expressions or words or symbols which have a predefined meaning in Java. And you cannot override this meaning because this meaning is already defined by Java and you can use those expressions, those symbols and those words in only the way Java wants you to. There is no way you can change the meaning of those terms or those symbols. So we will be covering those tokens in today's lecture. These tokens are broadly divided into five different categories. These categories are keywords, identifiers, constants, special symbols and operators. So let's talk about each of them one by one. So when we talk about keywords, these are the words which are reserved by Java and they have a predefined meaning. You might have already seen some of these reserved keywords. 
For example, we have used int when we were working on the primitive data type lecture. We have seen this as well, though we haven't actually found out the meaning of this, but we will find out the meaning of this in the coming lectures. So don't worry about that. We have seen Boolean as a, as a data type again. We have seen byte. So these Boolean, byte, int, uh, class, char, catch, super, switch, synchronized, all the, all the keywords which you see here, these keywords have a predefined meaning in Java. And you use these keywords so that you want to take an action, an expected action by Java. For example, if you call something as int, then you want Java to treat it as int. Int will only have a single meaning in Java and there is no other meaning of int in a, in a Java program. So that's the intent with the keywords. These are reserved words which have a predefined meaning. And we will cover these keywords at length during this whole course. The next token is identifier. And identifier is, is nothing but just a variable name technically. And we have already covered this, this kind of identifier when we were showing the demonstrations for primitive data types and non-primitive data types, etc. It's basically anything which you declare as a variable is an identifier. And when you declare the variable name, again, Java puts some sort of restrictions as to what you can or cannot do when you work with Java and you declare the variable names. For example, these variable names cannot start with numbers. So you cannot have a variable name which starts with any number. You cannot have a variable name which contains spaces in between them. You either have to fill those uh, uh, if, if, there's a, if there's a variable name which you think has two parts, for example, student name, then you need to write it as student underscore name so that you can create the variable name with the same impact and still does not contain space. So spaces will not be allowed when you create the variable names. Similarly, you cannot have plus, hyphen and ampersand in the variable names as well. These are the restrictions which Java puts on the identifier tokens when, whenever you create identifiers. The next one is constants and we will cover these constants in detail in the coming lectures as well. But to give you an idea of what constants are, so constants are basically exactly what they sound like. They are the identifiers which you have declared in your program whose value cannot be changed once defined. So if you write something as final int i equal to 5, then this value is fixed. You cannot change the value of i again in the program. Java will not allow you to change the value of i again because i has now become a constant because you have put a final keyword in front of it. And again, final is a keyword, you see? Final is a keyword basically. So you, so these constants are treated specially by Java that Java will make sure that their values will never change during the course of the execution of the program. This can come really handy when you have situations where you do not want the certain variables values to be, to be modified. For example, if you have an application where you are counting the number of applicants and if you have declared the number of applicants as final, then every time you call the application, you can do a plus one to the previous value. The value will not be reinitiated. So it is very useful concept and, and it can be very handy in programs where you don't want to change the values. The next is special symbols. These special symbols are the symbols which again have a predefined meaning in Java. We have already seen this square bracket symbol in our previous lecture when we were creating arrays. So whenever you use these square brackets, then Java would understand that you are trying to either access or create an array or you are trying to access or create a list, etc. So this is predefined. You cannot use this anywhere else or with any other meaning. Similarly, when we talk about these braces, these standard brackets or standard braces, these again have a predefined meaning in Java. Generally, whenever you will write functions and methods in Java, you will use uh, these brackets to define the parameters of the function. Now you cannot use these brackets in any other meaning in Java. Java will not allow you to use this anywhere else apart from using it in method parameters. Similarly, the next one is uh, the curly braces and the curly braces are used to define a code block in Java. You might have already noticed that when we were looking at the previous demos, you could see some curly braces, then some code and then the, and then the curly braces would end. For example, if I show you here, it just, it's just a sample example. And let me open the example which we covered in the last lecture. 
So you can see this curly brace here and this curly brace ends here, right? So this defines a code block in Java. Any code block which you want Java to understand will always be starting with a curly braces and ending with a curly brace. Remember I talked about the standard braces. You can see these are the standard braces opening and ending. And this is where we are defining this particular methods arguments. Now what is method? What is argument? Don't worry about that. We will cover in detail, but just an introductory concept. Whenever you are trying to define a method and you want to pass any argument to the method, you use these brackets to do that. Okay. Uh, similarly, this is semicolon is used to uh, close any Java statement. So you will see this semicolon here. Every Java statement has to have a semicolon as ending. Otherwise, Java will complain that it is a syntactical error. So it is part of the syntax. You need to put the semicolon and semicolon has only one meaning in Java, which is that the, your statement is actually ending. Uh, then we have star and star is used for multiplication and then we have equality which is used for assigning any values and again assigning any values is everywhere you are seeing this equality sign everywhere so these are all tokens basically the last type of token we have is operators and we will cover these operators in the upcoming lectures in detail with the examples but these operators are basically some special symbols like for arithmetic it would be plus minus multiplication divide for comparison, it will be uh, greater than, less than. For logical, it would be ampersand uh, and, and pipe operators. Bitwise, again, will have some bitwise operation uh, operators. They, so, they, so these are basically different categories of operators. And under each category of operators, there are certain symbols. Like for arithmetic, we have plus minus. We have com for comparison, we have greater than, less than, etc. So these, again, symbols are also reserved by Java under the operators tokens category. You cannot use these in any other meaning or in any other way. And like, like I said, we will look at a detailed example of this as well in the coming lectures. So this was a quick overview of what are different types of tokens in Java. So we have keywords, we have identifiers, constants, special symbols and operators. So this is it. This is all what I wanted to cover in today's lecture. And in the next session, we will be looking at data type conversions. Let's get started with data type conversions. So when we talk about data type conversion, the whole idea is to basically answer the question that whether I can convert a int data type variable into a long data type variable or a long data type variable to a float data type variable and also vice versa. Can I go back? Can I convert a float variable into a long variable or an int variable and vice versa? So this lecture is about answering all of those questions and we will basically look at some examples to understand how the conversion works. But let me just explain the basic principle. The basic principle is that smaller box can fit into larger box. But if we have to fit a larger box into a smaller box, you need to do something else. So what do we mean by smaller box and larger box here? The smaller box is a variable or a data type which has a smaller range. If you remember, we talked about the range of short, byte, int, etc. And we could see that as we go from short to byte to int to long to float to double, the ranges were increasing, right? So we will follow the same kind of analogy that if we have to store a smaller range variable into a larger range variable, Java will automatically do that. But if I have to store a larger range variable into a smaller range variable, then I have to sacrifice some quality of the value. And we will look at the examples of that as well. So let's first look at, uh, look at the example where we can store a smaller range variable into a larger range variable. We call this as implicit data type conversion. So here you can see I have declared an int variable with the value 100 and I'm printing the int variable. Then I have declared a long variable and what I'm doing that I'm assigning the value of int a to the long variable b. So I'm not assigning a new value to this long variable, but rather I'm just passing on the existing integer value into a variable of type long. Similarly, after that, I am taking the value of this variable of long type and storing this value into a float type. So you can see int is basically smaller than long and long has a smaller range than float. So I'm just storing a smaller range variable 
into a larger range and then a larger range variable into the largest range and then I am printing all the variables values to see if this actually is working. Can long automatically store the value of A and can float automatically store the value of B. Here I am just printing the variables and again using the uh, concept of the previous lecture. This is just to print the values and I will cover this in detail in the next lectures of how this works. But here you can understand that we can use system.out.println to basically print the values and here I am just printing a string and then the value. Then again the string and the value and here also the string and the value. So this is what is happening in this program and again don't worry about these details. I will cover about what these concepts are in the upcoming lectures. So let's run this and see if the data type conversion actually works. So I will just right click and do run as and go to Java application and if I click on this I get this output. So the first output is pretty straightforward. I'm just printing the int variable as is. So this works. Then I am storing the int into a long and printing the long representation of A which is B basically. And this also works without any errors or any warnings by Java. Similarly when I talk about storing the long variable into a float variable C this also works. But here you see an additional decimal precision here because as we remember from the previous sessions float is used to store values which have decimals or which have precisions. So it will automatically convert your absolute number into a number which has decimals whenever you try to cast this into float. Casting is also a word which is used. Some people call it as implicit data type conversion. Some people call it as implicit data type casting. So if you hear the word data type casting or implicit data type casting you can think that it is exactly the same concept as data type conversion. So this is about implicit data type conversion. Now let's look at an example of explicit data type conversion. How does that work? So using the same analogy of the boxes now I will try to store a larger ranging value variable into a smaller range variable and see how that looks like. So I will start with the largest which is which is double variable. So I have created a double variable and as we know that double is a uh, is a variable which is used to store decimal values. So I'm storing this value here and then I'm just printing the double representation as is without any changes. Then I'm trying to store this variable's value into a float variable. So I'm trying to go to a smaller box now. I'm trying to grow from double to float. And if you remember I told you that if you have to do that it will not work out of the box but you have to do a, a bit uh, uh, something special as well. And this is the special part. This is called type casting. Type casting is basically a way to tell Java to explicitly cast this variable's value into this data type's variable's value. And you always need to do this whenever there is no implicit casting happening. If you are trying to store a larger value variable into a smaller value variable, you have to do this otherwise Java will complain. You will get a compilation error. So that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm telling Java to store the value of A as a float and store the value in F and this is where I'm telling to store the value as float. So you just put brackets and you define float and then I'm printing the float representation. Similarly in the next one I am trying to store the value of this double variable into a long. So you can see now I'm trying to go even uh, from a precision data type to a non-precision data type because long does not understand decimal values. So I'm trying to store a variable which has decimal values into a variable data type which does not understand decimal values. And we will see how the output looks like but here also you need to do the explicit casting. Explicitly you need to tell which data type this A needs to be converted into. That's what I do here and then I print the long variable here. And then next I will again go down further and I will try to store a larger long variable type into a smaller int variable type. So again I'm trying to uh, store the value of B into a smaller data type which is integer and I'm naming the variable as C. Here again I have to do this explicit casting. I'm telling that telling Java to explicitly uh, cast the value of B which is a long data type variable into an integer C which is an int data type variable and then I'm just printing the value. So this is what is happening in this program that from double to float to long to int. Now let's run this program and see what happens. 
So I will right click and go to run as and choose the Java application option. And this is the output I get. First of all, for the double representation, the value gets printed. Uh, zero is ignored. Then in the float, it works fine as well without any precision loss because float can also print values up to one to two decimal points without any problems, even beyond that actually. So it works fine. Then when we talk about the long representation, we are trying to convert a double variable into a long variable and we see that the precision, the decimal values are lost. This is expected because long does not understand decimal values. That's why anything after the decimal, or in fact, the whole decimal portion is gone when you're trying to store double or float into some absolute data type variables like int or long. And then in int representation, since you already have this long, this long can easily be casted to int by just providing this explicit casting and the int representation also prints 50. So we started from this value and we ended up with these values when we try to store them as long or int. So this is all I wanted to cover in, in today's lecture. So we covered basically about the data type conversion or data type casting concepts. How does implicit data type casting works and how does explicit data type casting works. And as we know the concept, the basic concept is that the, uh, the value can easily be casted from a smaller range to a larger range without any changes or without any extra code. But when you have to go from a larger value to a smaller value, you have to provide these casting instructions to Java to successfully cast those variables. In the next session, we will be looking at how we can write the first Hello World program in Java. And there we will actually cover all the all these things which, which I have been saying that we will cover. So we will cover all these uh, ways of how we can write the first Hello World program in Java. Let's get started with how to write your first program in Java. So I have been talking about this lecture and the details of this lecture in the previous lectures as well. And today we are going to focus exactly on how do we actually write a Java program. So as we have already covered how you can install Eclipse and how you can create a sample Java project in Eclipse. If you haven't seen that, please go back to my previous videos where you can actually see that. And once you have created your Java project, so your Java project might look like something like this. You will have an SRC folder here so, and uh, under the SRC folder, uh, you see some, some namespaces sort of things created here, right? We call these as packages and in Java, you can think of package as something which can group multiple related artifacts together. This is simply a grouping mechanism. I can say it's a way to put all the related artifacts to a particular business problem into a certain place. For example, if you are working in an e-commerce application, so you have, you might have created multiple Java files for, uh, let's say for checkout and then some more Java files for the uh, filters flow, I would say, then some other Java files for designing the advertisements. So you have multiple Java files and these Java files now belo belong to these three different domains. So you want to group them together for easy accessibility for referencing each other uh, files with the, within the code. So if you want to achieve that kind of flexibility, you would group the checkout code files into a single package. You can name it as checkout package. Then you can similarly do the same thing for the advertisement package and for the filters package. So similarly, uh, I have created some packages here, which you can see. You see a package here, which says, IO GitHub Vikesh Pandey Hello World. And how do you create a package? You just right click on this. So you go to the SRC and you right click, you go to new and here you will see this option which says package. So you can just click on this and write anything which you want as the package name. Let's call it as test package. Uh, it says invalid uh, because the package is a keyword. So it is not allowing me to put package here, but let's call it test package one. And you can just click finish and you will see a test package popping up here. Then you can right click on this again, go to new and then you can create a Java class. Now what is a Java class? A class is basically a blueprint for an object. It's basically the specifications of an object. Like I covered in the very first lecture, everything in Java is an object or most of the things in Java are object, I would say. So object is basically an instance of the class. So let's say you create a class for, the, if I take the same example of e-commerce, you create a class for 
writing the business logic of checkout and then you create instance of this particular class to work for a particular customer order. So class is basically a blueprint. It's the specification. It's the skeleton of the object. So once you click on this, you can create a class. Now Eclipse is a pretty smart IDE. It will provide you with bunch of options on how you actually can create a class. What uh, and it will also provide you with some uh, sensible defaults. For example, it will automatically select a source folder in your project which you have created. It will automatically select a package. In fact, they currently selected package. And if you want to change the package, just hit browse and choose any other package which you want to choose. So your your class file will be created in that package. Then you can provide a name to the class. So let's call it as test hello world. And you can see I have followed a, a sort of a naming convention here. The first character I've kept it as capital and then any other new word which is coming in my class file name is also capitalized. So Java would expect you uh, and it would encourage you to follow this naming convention that whenever you are creating a class always start with a capital letter then small letters and every new word you are writing can start with a capital letter again. Java will not throw an error if you don't do this uh, uh, H capital or W capital, but it's a good practice. The next thing is the modifier. We are going to cover the modifiers in details in the in the uh, upcoming lectures. But for now, you can understand that anything which is uh, marked as public is accessible to every other Java class in this whole project. That's the basic meaning of making a class as public. Public as the name uh, suggests itself, it means it's visible to everyone. You can select a super class and again we'll talk about this super class later but if this is the Java Lang object is the super class of all the classes which are created in Java. Again interface is again an advanced concept and there are some other interesting uh, uh, defaults it provides for, the, for example if you want to create a main method. Now what is a main method? We'll just cover it in a while. So I will not do that. I will leave everything as default and I will click on finish. So I have this new file coming up here and you can see it has automatically picked up the package which I selected and it has also written public class test hello world with a starting and ending curly braces. In the previous lecture we covered about this curly braces that all the code block have to be in the curly braces. Whenever you write a Java class the very first statement Java would expect to have in the class is package name. So make sure that you have package as a keyword and then the actual package name as the package name for that particular class. You can see the package follows a dot convention and it always ends with a semicolon like all the Java statements end with semicolon. So that would be the first thing which you will write in your class. Second thing is the access modifier of the class. Like I said, you want this class to be accessible to every other uh, file in this project. Then you can mark this class as public. The next thing is the class keyword. You need to write this particular keyword as is, otherwise your class will not be detected. So you write this as class. Then you write test hello world or whatever name you want to write. But make sure that whatever public class name you provide here, that name should match with the file name. These two things should match the file name and the class name. If they don't match, you would experience weird behaviors as the class will not be compiled or class might not be able to run, etc. So always make sure that whatever file name you provide, you always have a class with that name in your file. So my class structure is, is ready, but there's nothing here in this class. In fact, you cannot, you cannot even execute this class because for executing the class, for executing any class in Java, any class at all in Java, you would need a main method in Java. Main method is the entry point method of the Java. Whenever you are trying to run any application, be it a very small or very large Java application, you would always and always need a main method in the, in the class, in the project somewhere. And you need to tell the Java uh, runtime to execute that class and then the class will have a main method and the, your program will start executing. So always have a main method, otherwise your program will not execute. And how do you write the main method? So you first write public, then you write static, then you write void and then you write main and then you provide a parameter to this method as this. Now let's understand what did I actually write here. First keyword is public because this method has to be public because like I said Java runtime needs to be able to access this method. 
So the similar concept which applied on the class is applied on this method as well that the entry point method has to be public otherwise Java will not be able to find this method. So you need to make this method exactly as public. The next keyword is static. You again need to uh, write this keyword as is and the reason we write static here is because we uh, we want to run this particular class without creating an object of the class. Static is again a keyword which we will cover in the upcoming lectures but for now you can understand that whenever you want to access something within the class without creating an object then you need to create it as static. The next is void. Void is basically the return type of this method. The method name is main and it has to be main. It cannot be main1 or main2 otherwise if you do that Java will not be able to run your program because it will expect you to write this particular method exactly as what I have written here. No changes at all should be there. If you make any changes Java program will not run because it will not be able to find the entry point method which is the main method. So public, static, void, main. Remember that you need to have this in your program. So void is the return type which means that this particular program it will not return anything back to the runtime because a method can have this capability to either return something or not return something. For example, a method which can uh, add two numbers will return the result of addition, right? So we return the result. Return is the word here. In this case, this method is not expected to return anything because there's nobody consuming it, right? Java runtime will not do anything with the, with the return value of this particular method. That's why Java will force you to write void here and main is the exact method name which you need to use. Java will expect you to supply a string array argument if we covered arrays in bit detail in the in the in the previous lectures and we will cover arrays in actually in the next lecture in very detail but you can uh, as we discussed that array is basically a sequence of characters or words or integers or anything right so in this case this is basically uh, the mandatory parameter which you need to write as is this parameter name can be anything obviously it can be arg args or whatever you want to write it as but the basic fundamental is that java will basically supply all the command line arguments using this particular string array that's why you need to provide this then let's write something in the program because this is a hello world program so i will just write system dot out dot print ln and i'll type a string here which says hello world and a semicolon. So again I have been saying that I will explain this and now I will explain this. Why do we need this and what does this mean? So as I have told earlier that whenever you want to print something on the console in a Java program you need to write system.out.println. Now system here if you just go if you just hover over it Eclipse will show what it is. So system is basically a class which contains several useful class fields and methods it cannot be instantiated means uh, you cannot create an object of it and it provides many facilities like standard input, standard output and error output. Exactly what we want to focus here because we want to use system class to print something on the standard output. The standard output in this case is the console. So if you want to input something or you want to output something or you want to output an error then you need to use system class and all of these standard input standard output and error are streams and that's what comes to the next word what is this out out is a stream to print standard output similarly we have system.err which is for printing the error output streams similarly we have system.in for taking its standard input streams so system.in system.out system.err these all are these in out and err are streams and then print ln is the actual method let's hover over that let's first see out here so you can see this is a stream object which is used to print anything which is ready to accept output data basically and then we go to the print ln method and it says prints a string and then terminate the line so like i mentioned earlier as well this whole syntax is used to print and actually this is the core method this is the real method which prints something on the console so system class uses the output stream to print something on the console using the help of print ln method. There is also a print method. So there are two methods. One is print and one is print ln. 
The difference is that in case of print method, the print method will not provide you or terminate on a next line. But in, in system.out.println, the ln means line here. It will print something and it will bring the cursor to the next line. If you do not use this and if you again use another print statement, then both of the statements will be printed on the same line. I will show that as well. But uh, and then we provide any random string here which we want to print. So you right click on this particular program. You go to run as and you run as Java application and you want to save this. So you can say always save resources before launching and you see the output here. So this is how you can run your first Java program. Now let's also see the difference between system.out.println and system.out.print. So I will just copy this here and I'll say hello world one, let's say, and this time I will not use system.out.println, but I will use system.out.print. Just put a space here so that it's visible. So if I use print, how does that look like? I go to run and I go to run as Java application. So now you see both of the outputs are printed on the same line. There is no, this output hasn't gone to the next line. And now if I run the same program with system.out.println methods, now both of these outputs will be divided on two lines. The first output, then a line break. The hello world one goes to the next line. In the previous run, the hello world one was printing right next to it on the same line. So that is the difference. So this is how you can build your very first program, the hello world program in Java. In the next session, we will be discussing about arrays in Java. Let's get started with arrays in Java. We discussed about arrays uh, in a bit detail when we talked about the non-primitive data types, but this is a concept and a topic which needs to be understood well. So that's why we'll go, uh, we'll do a deep dive on arrays in this particular lecture. So as I described earlier that array is basically a container which can store values or a sequence of values or sequence of numbers or sequence of characters into itself. We can think of it as a box which can store all the values in a continuous fashion. As you can see here, this is a, just a pictorial representation and this is coming from the official Java docs. And you can see that we, if we create an array of size 10, then we have these 10 blocks created here. You can see one to 10th. So the whole length of boxes, the number of boxes here are 10, but the way arrays are designed is that the index, index is basically used to access the element in this particular box. The index of the boxes start from zero. So it goes from zero to nine. So remember the array length is 10, it array, the array can contain 10 elements, but the index of the array starts with zero and will always end at length minus one, which is 10 minus one in this case, which comes as nine. So it will always be length minus one. It will always start, the index will always start from zero and go till length minus one. Length can be anything. In this case, the length is 10. So the index ends at nine. If the length was 20, the last index will be 19. But in total, you have these 10 memory locations. We also call them as continuous memory locations because they are continuously placed and array basically blocks 10 memory locations and creates a container over it. So this is how an array basically looks like inside the memory. And uh, whenever you want to access the elements of the array, you will say array of zero or array of one or array of two. You basically need to specify the index to access the element at index. For example, if you want to access the element which is sitting in this box, you need to say array of index eight. And we'll see how we can do that. But this is the basic uh, understand, understanding and idea of the concept of arrays. So let's try to understand this with the help of an example. I will switch back to Eclipse IDE and I've created a very simple program here to demonstrate the functionality of uh, arrays here. So we already covered in the previous lecture of what is package and what is public and what is class. How do we give the class name and what is the meaning of this particular method? So I'm not going to cover that again. We'll start directly from here. So here, the first thing which I'm doing is I'm declaring an array of integer. This is a variable name, the identifier basically, it can be anything. And this is the data type. It's an integer array. And as we, as we covered this as well, that whenever you put square bracket in front of a data type, it becomes an array data type. So this is an integer array representation. Now, 
we just declared an array but we still haven't allocated a size to it so you can do that with this particular uh, syntax so you can put the variable name of the array and say new int and put the right size here this size can be anything and once you do this now array will actually allocate those memory boxes which we covered here but the moment you do new int 10 this box these boxes continuous boxes will be placed in the memory and the memory is allocated to this array we call this memory allocation this is how you allocate memory to the array so we allocated memory to this array for storing 10 integers the next thing is now we can start storing elements in those boxes so like i said that the array index always starts with zero so if you have to store the first element you actually have to store it at index zero location so you give the array name you provide these square brackets and you put the index value within the square brackets that is how you basically point to a particular element inside the array so we say an array of zero and we put the value 100 then we initialize the second element which will be index one then will be the third element which will be index two fourth element index three fifth element index four sixth element index five and so on and till we store till the last element so this is the tenth element which is accessible as index 9 and the value is uh, 1000 basically. So from 100 to 1000, we stored 10 values in this array and we stored them by accessing the index and this is actually the only way you can store values in the array by pointing to the indexes. So we go from 0 to 9 and we stored all the values. 0 being the first element and array of 9 being the last and the 10th element. Remember the length minus 1 concept. Okay, so now we will try to print all the elements one by one. That's pretty much what we are doing now. So as we covered in the previous lecture that we use system.out.println to print anything and we understood the whole meaning of this. So I'm not going to repeat that. Now uh, we want to print the first element. The first element is sitting at index zero and we can access that element with this syntax by providing the variable name and the actual index value so i'm just writing a random string here which says element at index 0 and then i'm putting this plus here and putting the variable name this plus is basically used to concatenate the output of a static string with a random variable or basically you can print anything uh, with using plus plus is used for concatenation so i'm just trying to print this whole value but here this is a string value which is a static string and then i have a value coming from the array so whenever you have to print some value from a particular data type or variable or collection then you can use this plus syntax to concatenate a string static string with your actual value so that's what i've done here by saying plus and array zero and similarly for index one i'm printing the uh, uh, the first index then for two three so far and so on so forth till the index nine so basically i'm just printing the all the values of the array starting from index 0 to index 9 so that's all which which is written in this program now let's try to run this program so i will right click go to run as and go to java application and hit on this and now if i just expand this console you can see all the system.out.println statements have been executed and they printed this so this is the static string, uh, string part in fact including the colon this is the static string part element and in index 0 printing exactly as is and then dynamically the 0th index element of an array is printed here similarly we have printed the index 1 location element index 2 location element index 3 location element and so on so forth till the index 9 location element so in total these are the 10 elements but the index always works from 0 to length minus 1 in this case it will be going from 0 to 9 so this is basically all which i wanted to cover in this lecture the whole idea was to give you more understanding of arrays and remember this is just an integer array you can similarly create a character array you can also create a string array for uh, for you as well so it, it it's completely uh, it's completely uh, related to the data type you are using if you create a char array then you can only store characters into it if you create a string array then you can only store strings into it and now you can probably relate back to this particular thing which i explained in the previous lecture that we create this string array for the reason that when you run this particular program 
and if you want to provide any command line values command line arguments to the program those arguments will automatically be stored in this args and then you can access this as args of 0 args of 1 etc in your program that's the whole concept so these are this is the basically the deep dive on array which i wanted to cover and in the next session we are going to cover about operators in java let's get started with operators in java when we talk about operators in java there are multiple types of operators like assignment operators arithmetic operators unary operators then we have conditional operators and logical operators and we also have bitwise operators and we will cover all of these operators one by one we will understand what how, what these operators are and how they work and we will also look at a demonstration of it so let's get started the first operators we are going to discuss is about arithmetic operators and assignment operators and we will also see if we can cover unary operators so when we talk about assignment operators i have again opened the official java docs here if we understand assignment operators we have been using this operators all the while in all of the demos so far and the basic idea is very simple whenever you assign a value to a variable you use the assignment operator which is nothing but the equal sign we have already covered this in multiple demos so i will not cover this as part of the demo but what i'm going to cover in detail is about these arithmetic operators so arithmetic operators are basically used to perform any kind of arithmetic operation on a java program it can be an addition operation it can be a subtraction operation it can be a multiplication operation a division operation or an operation by which you can find the remainder of the division so we will look at each of these uh, with an example and as you can see the symbols are expectedly what you generally use in mathematics so you see the the plus sign here which is for addition you see the minus sign which is for subtraction you see the star sign which is for multiplication you see the slash sign which is for division and you see the percentage sign which is for finding the remainder of a division so let's see an example of each of these and how we can use them in a in a java program so for the arithmetic operations i have prepared a demonstration of it in the eclipse ide again i'm using the same java project which i have shown you we created in our previous lectures so i will for all the demonstrations i will just continue on the same project so again the way to create a class remains the same exactly the same as how i covered in the previous lecture in the hello world program where we created a class so here also i created a class i named the class as arithmetic demo and i have a public static void main method inside this particular class and i have basically try to demonstrate each of the operation so let's start with the addition operation first so i create an integer variable here named as result and then i try to use the addition operator to make this variable store the result of this addition so it's a simple 1 plus 2 you can also create two different variables for 1 and 2 let's say x equal to 1 and y equal to 2 and you can also do int result equal to x plus y it will have the same effect but just for simplicity i have put the literal numbers here so result is storing the the uh, expression value of 1 plus 2 and then i'm printing this value here you can see i'm printing the result variable here with using system dot out dot println then i'm storing this result into a variable into a new variable original result with using the assignment operator and then i'm trying to subtract something from it so now i'm saying result equal to result minus 1 it means whatever the current value of result is subtract minus 1 from that value so the value was 3 here and here 3 minus 1 becomes 2 so the new value of result becomes 2 the original result still holds 3 because it is storing the old value the new value of result has now become 2 so i'm printing the original result and then what i'm doing that i'm again assigning the new result which is 2 to the original result so now original result and result both are at 2 then i move ahead and i try to demonstrate the multiplication operation so i take the same variable result and i say multiply it by 2 so whatever the value of result was which at this place should be 2 multiply that value by 2 so 2 into 2 
the new value of result should become 4 after this multiplication operation and again I'm assigning the value of original result to this particular variable and then I'm showcasing the fourth mathematical arithmetic operation which is division so you can see result by 2 here so basically I'm, whatever the current value of result is I'm dividing that value by 2 so 4 divided by 2 should become 2 so again the new value of the result variable should become 2 then I'm printing the value and again storing the value back into the original result then the next operation is again an addition operation where I whatever the value of result is at this particular point which is 2 add 8 to that particular value so the new result value becomes 10 and then I'm printing that particular value again assigning the original result to the result and then to showcase the remainder operation I'm doing result we call this particular operator as mod or modulus so result modulus 7 so the current value here is in this case would be 10 so I'm saying 10 mod 7 so 10 mod 7 would become 3 because if we divide 10 by 7 the remainder should be 3 and this modulus operator is used to calculate the remainder of a division operation so that 3 will be stored in this result variable and then we print that particular variable so that is what I'm doing if I take you back up there I'll just minimize this window and this window as well so if I take you back to the starting I'm doing an addition first here at line 7 then I am doing a subtraction at line 12 then I'm doing a multiplication at line 17 and a division at line 22 and then again an addition at line 27 and then a modulus at line 32 and I'm printing the respective values so let us run this program and see what results do we get so I right click I go to run as I go to Java application there is also a shortcut for it if you want to use the shortcut you can use that so I click on this and the output is, is displayed here so you can see let me bring this output back to its original position yeah I just dragged it here to the top uh, to the bottom so if we start from the top and see what all results did we get printed so line 9 says 1 plus 2 equal to the value of result so 1 plus 2 equal to at this particular point the result value was 3 because 1 plus 2 equal to 3 moving on the next variable here is minus so the current value was 3 we said 3 minus 1 which becomes 2 and we store the value of result or 3 into this result variable and we print that value at line 14 so original result plus original result is 3 then a string here minus 1 equal to so this is just a string and then the actual current result value which is 2 so far so good we move ahead and then at line 19 we are multiplying the current value of result by 2 and again displaying the original result and the current value so 2 is the original result here because here 3 minus 1 had become 2 so original result value was 2 multiply that by 2 becomes 4 then moving on to the line 24 2 by uh, 4 by 2 should become 2 so 4 by 2 equals 2 the current value of result then again moving on to the next variable uh, at line 29 now the result value should become 10 because 2 plus 8 is 10 and again we are printing the original result and then the current result value so the original result was 2 then we added 8 to it and the new result value had become 10 which is coming from this particular variable moving on to line 34 we are again printing the original result which was 10 here and then we are saying this particular string which is modulus 7 and the current value of result is coming from this expression which is 10 modulus 7 and like I said modulus or mod operation is basically used to calculate the remainder of a division operation which so 10 divided by 7 remainder is 3 so that becomes 3 and that's why you see the value 3 so this is a demonstration to show you how we can use the addition multiplication subtraction division and modulus operators which are all the arithmetic operators so in the next session we will be discussing about the other operator types which are unary operators and we will also discuss some other interesting operators which are popularly used in java let's get started with unary operators so when we talk about unary operators technically they are also arithmetic operators but they provide us a shorthand 
or they have a more advanced meaning. So if you see on the screen, these are the unary operators. We call them as unary plus, unary minus, increment operator, decrement operator and logical complement operator. So when we talk about the unary plus operator, basically it is used to indicate a positive value. So whatever value you are having, it will just make that number as positive number. You might be wondering that this plus has an addition meaning as well, right? Which we saw in the previous example. Yes, that's correct. But when we use that addition symbol, we use that between two variables. But when we talk about unary operators, they are used with a single variable. That is why the name unary because they are used with a single variable. They require only one operand. So unary plus basically makes any number positive. Unary minus negates an expression and makes that number negative. Increment operator increments the value by plus one. Decrement operator decreases the value by minus one. And logical complement operator inverts the value of the expression from true to false or false to true. Let's understand this with the help of an example. So I have created a class here called unary demo and I have a static void main method here and I have created a variable called result and the first example is about using unary plus. So I'm creating a, a variable called as result, assigning the value as one and just putting one plus in front of it, which makes this as positive value. Though we can argue that this also has the same effect as this. And yes, that is true. But in case if this value was written as something like minus one instead of plus, then we could basically make that number positive by just putting plus in front of it. So that's basically the power of unary operators and that's how you generally use unary operators. So I'll just put it back to plus one. The next example is about decrement operators. So the current value of result was one because we did this. Now we are saying result minus minus, which means whatever the value of result is, just decrement it by one. So the current value was one. So now the new value of result after this evaluation becomes zero. So at line 14, we print the current value of result, which is zero. Moving on at line 16, we are using the increment plus plus operator here, which means whatever the current value of result is, just increment it by one. So the current value of result was zero till this line. So it becomes one because this means increment by one. So line 18 will basically print that value one. And then at line 20, I'm using the unary minus operator which means whatever the value of result is, just negate it, just put a negative in front of it, just make that number negative. So if I just say minus result, the current value of result was one, so it became minus one. And then to showcase the negation operation, I created a Boolean variable, named it as success, assigned the value of this variable as false, and printed the value of success variable as is first, and then printed the value of success with a negation in front of it with an exclamation mark, which will basically flip the value or invert the value of a Boolean variable. So if this was false, line 28 should print true. If this was true, line 28 should print false. In this case, this is false. So the line 28 should print true. So let's right click on this and run this program and see if we get the expected output. And yes, we see the output here. So let's try to interpret the output now. The line 10 should print one. Yes, the line 14 should print zero. We see zero here. Line 18 should print one because we use the increment plus plus. So zero plus one became one. Then we use the unary minus operator. So the value should become minus one. Yes, we see minus one here. And then for Boolean variable, we should see first the false because the value is printed as is and then we are printing a negated value. So we should flip the value from false to true. And yes, it is printing the value as true. So this was about unary operators. Now, when we talk about this increment and decrement operators, what if I put this particular value in front of result? What effect is that going to happen? Let's analyze that part as well. So for that, I have prepared a separate demo. Again, I've created a class called pre post demo and it has a public static void main method. I'm declaring an integer variable i with the value as three. 
so the i becomes 3 here and then i'm saying i plus plus as we have already seen in the unary demo example this should increment the value of 3 to 4 so it will print 4 expected right then at line number 9 i'm putting this plus plus in front of i now what will happen now it is going to increment the value of i and then basically assigning the value of i so the whole difference between i++ and++ i is that in this case the value of i is assigned first and increment later in this case the value of i is incremented first and assigned later so here the value from 4 becomes 5 so at, at line 11 if you see if we print i it will print 5 because we have we are saying that first increment the value and then update the value of i so increment happens on i equal to 4 and i becomes 5 at line number 13 it, it becomes more interesting because here inside the system.out.println statement itself i'm saying plus plus i now what will happen like i explained first the value will be incremented and then the value will be assigned so before printing the value is getting incremented so the value from 5 becomes 6 here at line 13 but if i try to do this now i am saying first assign the value of i and then increment it so i at this line is still 6 because i has already been assigned 6 and as the post increment says if you put this plus plus after the variable it means that you are first assigning the value and then incrementing the value so anything which happens after line 15 the value of i will become 7 but at line 15 the value of i is still 6 because we are using a post increment operator so the value is still assigned to i as is and then incremented and when we do system.out.println the assigned value is printed not the incremented value so like i said after line 15 the value of i will become incremented by 1 and it will become 7. So hope you understood this example or, and the difference between the pre-increment and post-increment. Remember the thumb rule that if we put plus plus before a variable like at line number 9, the value will be incremented first and then assigned. So at line 13, the updated value will be printed because the first we are doing the increment and then we are printing the value or assigning the value. Similarly at line 15, we are first printing the value and then incrementing the value. So when the value is printed at line 15, the old value of i will be printed. But after line 15, the new value of i will be accessible to the program. So let's right click on this and run this program. And now if we see the values, we assigned i to 3. We did a post increment here. So i becomes 4. We print the value of i. So here the value of i is 4. You see 4 here. Then at line line uh, uh, 9, we are saying plus plus i. So 4 plus 1 becomes 5. Though this is a pre-increment, but since we are not printing this plus plus i as is, it does not have any, any change. So the value of 4 becomes 5. At line 11, we print 5. Then at line 13, we are saying plus plus i, which means increment the value of i first and then assign it. So the value of 5 becomes 6 and then i gets updated and printed similarly at line 15 first the value of i is assigned and printed and then incremented so at line 15 the value is still 6 you see the 6 here and then the value is incremented so after line 15 the value becomes 7 so that's how we are basically using the unary operators and this is where i would like to end this particular session in the next session we will be discussing about other type of operators which are comparison operators and logical operators etc let's get started with equality and relational operators when we talk about relational operators they are sometimes also called comparison operators and the basic idea behind using these operators is to compare things or compare the values of variables or compare the objects in java so in java if you need to compare anything for example, if you want to compare if something is less than the other thing or something is greater than the other thing or something is equal to the other thing, then you need to use the comparison operators which are provided by Java. 
Here you can see um, I have opened the official Java docs and you can see a bunch of comparison or relational operators. Both of the terms are used interchangeably. Some people call them comparison operators and some people call them relational operators. So you can see if I want to compare if an object or a value is equal to another value, then I use the double equal sign. If I want to compare for non equality, I will use exclamation with an equal to which means not equal to. If I want to do a greater than comparison, then I will use the mathematics greater than symbol. If I want to do the greater than equal to or less than or less than equal to, they again follow the same kind of uh, terminology as we see in mathematics. So this is all we have in terms of the relational operators. So let's understand the usage of these operators with the help of some examples. So as you can see, I have created a class here which is called comparison operator. There is a public static void main method inside this class. And this method has two variables of integer type called value one and value two. Value one has the value one and value two has the value two. And then I am trying to compare the value one and value two variables using the different relational operators we just covered. For doing that, I need to use a conditional operator as well. We will be covering conditional operators in much, much detail in the upcoming lectures. But for now, you can understand that when we talk about conditional operators, we talk about if and else statement. So if is again a keyword in Java, which can be used to compare things. And the syntax is very straightforward. You write the if keyword and then you write the actual comparison syntax or the actual comparison expression. So in the first example, we can see that I'm writing a condition which says evaluate if value one is equal to value two. I should put a curly braces around here. You can see there are no curly braces here, but that is for a case when you have only one statement under it. But again, I will cover this in detail and, and I don't want to confuse the audience here. So I will just put curly braces around all of these if statements so that it becomes easy to interpret what is actually going on in these code blocks. As we know that these curly braces are used to define a code block. So the first if block says compare if the value one is equal to the value two. If yes, then this condition will become two and the control of the program will go at line number 10. If this condition is not true, then the control will not go inside 10 because this condition is false. So it will never go to line 10 and it will move to line 11 or 12 instead. Similarly, the next condition is we are comparing the value one is not equal to value two. So this condition will only be true if these two values are not equal or unequal. And if that is the case, then line 14 will execute it. Otherwise, line 14 will not be executed. Similarly, in this condition, I'm saying compare if value one is greater than value two or not. So if the actual value holded by value one variable is greater than the value two variable, then this condition will become true and the line 18 will be executed. Otherwise, it will be skipped. Then similarly at line 20, I'm doing the reverse. I'm comparing if value one is less than equal less than value two. If that is the case, then line 22 will be executed. Otherwise, it will be skipped. And at last, I'm also showcasing an example of less than equal to operator that you put less than and equal to together. And again, you compare the two variables. Similarly, you can also use greater than equal to variable comparison uh, operator as well in this example. So we have an example of equality, not equal to greater than less than and less than equal to. Let's run this example to understand. So for running the example, I will just right click here, go to run as and click on Java application and we can see the output here. So as the value one holds the value one and value two variable holds the value two. Obviously one is not equal to two. So the first condition is not going to be evaluated to true. So line 10 will never be executed because one is not equal to two. Similarly, if I talk about the next condition, which was if value one is not equal to value two, then execute statement 14. And yes, one is not equal to two. That's why we see this particular system dot out dot print ln here. We see this printed moving on is value one greater than value two. So is one greater than two? No, it's not. So line 18 will never be executed. Then the next one is is value one less than value two. So yes, one is less than two. So line 22 will be executed and we see the line 22 output here system dot out dot print ln output moving on is one less than equal to two. 
yes one is less than equal to two so this particular condition is also true and line 26 will be executed and that's why we see this here and that's all so we can see that we are able to use these comparison or relational operators to evaluate different conditions and we write those conditions using the if block and again if you do not understand the if block fully don't worry we will be covering the if blocks in detail but the focus here is in using the operators the not equal to operators the greater than equal to operators less than equal to operators etc so i hope these operators give you better understanding of how to use them now moving on to the next section of this uh, comparison operators sometimes we also use some logical terms to do the comparison for example if i just move down here and i show you these conditions here we call them conditional operators conditional operators are used to evaluate the conditions like and or or and we use them in two two ways either we can use it as ampersand or double ampersand or we can use them as pipe or double pipes so the idea is basically to evaluate if one condition is true and other condition is also true or one condition is true or other condition is true so whenever you want to combine two conditions together that's where you're going to use these logical operators or conditional operators you can also use the simple english keywords like and or 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 you can use the logical representation of these keywords for example ampersand ampersand or double ampersand is equivalent to and similarly double pipe is equivalent to or so we can use these as well interchangeably you can e use either of these uh, operator representations to run a conditional check in composition meaning you can compare two conditions saying okay if one is true and second is true or one is true or second is true so the whole focus is here in and and or comparisons so let's switch back to the uh, ide and let's look at an example of this to understand this in detail so i will again take the similar kind of example again i have created two variables here value one and value two value one has value as one and second variable value two has value as two and then i'm writing two conditions this time in the same if block you can see i am writing first condition saying is value one equal to equal to one and is value two also equal to equal to two so this whole if condition is only going to be true only if both of the conditions are true that's the property of and and will force that both the conditions on the left hand side of it and the right hand side of it hold true and then only the whole expression is going to hold true even if one of the conditions evaluate to false the whole if expression will evaluate to false similarly for or, or conditions we again write a left hand condition and a right hand condition and in between we write this double pipe we can also write or or in english that will also have the same effect and this will evaluate in a way that this whole expression this whole expression will evaluate to true if even a single condition either on left side or right side of it becomes true so or will just need one expression to be true to make the whole if condition true whereas and will force both of the conditions to be true to make the whole expression as true so and will require two trues to actually become true but or condition will require only one true to become true so if we try to do uh, understand this logic here i am saying that if value 1 is equal to equal to 1 which is correct and value 2 is equal to equal to 2 then make this condition as true so yes in this case this condition will evaluate to true because value 1 has value 1, uh, one and value 2 has value as 2 so it will print the line 10 whereas in the next condition i'm saying evaluate if value 1 is equal to equal to 1 or value 2 is equal to equal to 1 so either of the expression if becomes true either the left side this expression or the right side this expression either of the expression becomes true this whole condition will become true and line 14 will be executed line 14 will not be executed only in a case when both of the conditions here become false for example if i write it like this then we know that value 1 is not equal to 4 because it's 1 and value 2 is not equal to 5 because it's true in that case both of the expression will become false and then line 14 will not be executed if i write it like this then 
the left hand expression is evaluated to true because value 1 is 1 but the right hand expression is false but it's fine the line 14 will still be executed because either of these side is true so the whole expression becomes true similarly here and will require both of the expressions to be true and if either of them becomes false then the whole expression becomes false so in the current state line 10 will be executed but if i change this to this then the left hand side of this ampersand will evaluate to false and the whole expression will evaluate to false in that case and line 10 will never be executed let's try to run all of these scenarios to make a better understanding of this so in this case both of the conditions should work fine so i will just right click and run as java application and yes we see this line 10 being printed and we also see this line 13 being printed so both of the lines are printed correctly both of the conditions are evaluating to true now let's try to play around with it let me change this value to 4 so now value 1 this left hand side expression is false which should make the whole expression as false and it should not print the line 10 which is this statement so let's run this program and see if that works yes we see that this particular line is not printed now because this whole expression became false because the left hand side of this expression became false similarly in the or case either of them has to have to be true you can see currently value 2 equal to equal to 5 condition will actually result in a false condition because this is not a true value 2 is actually 2 not 5 and still we see this particular expression because either of them have to be true if i make both of them as not true now both of the conditions on the left hand side of pipe and right hand side of pipe are false conditions what will happen now nothing will be printed the reason for that is that value 1 is also that this condition is also false and value 2 condition is also false so the whole expression became false and this was already false so this is all i wanted to cover in this lecture we covered about, about the comparison operators and how to use them and in the next lecture we are going to talk about the bitwise operators let's get started with bitwise operators now bitwise operators are very less commonly used in the java programming world generally we don't use them and generally we don't need to use them you would generally use them when you are doing really complex bitwise calculation where you need to manipulate the bits now what are actually bits so if you remember when we talked about the integer type variables we talked about how much memory each of the variable type or data type was going to consume we said that this will take one byte and this will take two bytes etc one byte is basically made up of eight bits and bits are nothing but positions where either a zero is stored or one is stored actually the whole machine will convert your whole program ultimately in zeros and ones which are nothing but bits so if you want to do the manipulation at that level so now you can understand you are you are actually working at right at the machine level understanding so if you want to manipulate the bits which are going to be understood by the machine at that level then you can use bitwise operators but like i said generally we don't need to use them now when we talk about bitwise operators there are multiple ways in which we can use them we can use them with the standard and or or operations if you remember we covered this and or or operations in the previous lecture you see a difference here that in case of and we are using a single ampersand or no, and not double ampersand this is one of the concept which we did not cover in the previous lecture and i would just like to brief you about this concept that if you use double ampersand that is also called a short circuit operator and if you use a single ampersand that is called a standard operator to build an understanding about this i will just quickly recap of what we covered in the last lecture and will try to explain these concepts as well so let's go to the logical operator demo and here if you remember there were two ampersands and two pipes this is also a valid expression a single ampersand is also a valid expression the only change is in this case even if the left hand condition evaluates to false still the right hand condition will be evaluated although we know that in case of and either of the expression needs to be false and the whole expression becomes false so java provides an advantage or with that if you use double ampersand and if the left hand operation becomes false then it will not cover the right hand operation it will not even evaluate the right hand operation because it doesn't matter if the left hand operation has already returned to false or evaluated to false then no matter whether right side is true or false the whole expression is still going to be false right 
that's the property of and one of the side has to be false and the whole expression becomes false so why why evaluate two sides why waste the memory in evaluating the right side when the left side has already turned as false java takes advantage of that and that's why if you use double ampersand you save a bit of processing power of your computer by just evaluating the left hand condition and if the left hand condition is false it will skip evaluating the right hand condition and just make the whole expression false but if you use this a single ampersand then both side of the expression will be evaluated irrespective of their output so in this case even if the left hand expression is false it is still going to evaluate the right side expression and similarly it works for the or case as well in this case in our case as we know if one of the condition is true the whole condition becomes true the whole expression becomes true so if the left hand side becomes true and if you use a single pipe then it will still evaluate the right hand side but if you use double pipe like this then if the left hand side becomes true then it knows that it does not matter if the right hand side becomes true or false because ultimately the whole expression is going to be true if either of the side is true so if the left hand side is already true it will not evaluate the right hand side and it will say the whole expression is true that's why you see the uh, single ampersand being used for bitwise just to explain why it why it is used and how it is used for or operations in bitwise you use this cap or whatever you want to call it as and for uh, the inclusive bitwise or uh, oper or operation you're going to use a single pipe you also use some shift operations where you shift the value of bit of a particular variable to either left or right again these are again very complex calculations if you want to use that please read about this and use that but in the in today's demo what we are going to cover is the and and or examples of bitwise operations so here i have again created a class called bitwise operator i have a public static void main method i have two variables here which are int a equal to 5 and int b equal to 7 now these 5 and 7 are actually stored as bits as zeros and ones in the computer's memory so how they are actually stored they are stored in a standard bit representation which you may have uh, studied in your mathematics if to, to give you a recap this 5 will basically be written in the memory as this 0 1 0 and it starts from here 2 raised to power 0 into 1 becomes 1 2 raised to power 1 into 0 becomes 0 2 raised to power 2 into 1 becomes 4 and 2 raised to power 3 into 0 becomes 0 so 4 0 plus 4 plus 0 plus 1 becomes 5 and that's how 5 is displayed to you similarly for 7 2 raised to power 0 into 1 is 1 plus 2 raised to power 1 into 1 is 2 so 1 plus 2 3 plus 2 raised to power 2 into 1 which is 4 so 1 plus 2 plus 4 7 and 2 raised to power 3 into 0 is Zero. So zero plus four plus two plus one, which is seven, and that's how this seven is built and stored. And now, if you try to do this, if you try to write this condition, you can also write the condition into a system dot out dot println block, and it will basically evaluate this condition. So now, if you say a and b, in this case, this is going to do a bitwise operation because this is bitwise operand. it is going to do a bitwise operation and the, what would be the result if you do an and on this so again use the same logic as if in case of and if one is false then the whole expression is false so 0 and 0 becomes 0 1 and 1 becomes 1 0 and 1 becomes 0 because 0 means false and 1 means true so if either of them is false the whole evaluation becomes false so that's why 0 or and 1 becomes 0 and 1 and 1 is always 1 the value of this is again 5 as we already have evaluated similarly if we do a bitwise or and if we do this again we are doing an or operation so 0 or 0 or basically false or false becomes false true or true becomes true false or true should be true because one of them needs to be true so this is false but this is true so the whole value becomes true and the finally true or true is also true so this is the final bitwise or result and if we convert this into an integer representation that becomes 7 because 2 raised to power 0 
into 1 is 1. 2 raised to power 1 into 1 is 2. So 2 plus 1, 3 plus 2 raised to power 2 into 1, which is 4. So 4 plus 2 plus 1, which is 7. And plus 2 raised to power 3 into 0, which is 0. So 0 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1 becomes 7. And that's how you get actually 7. So let's see if we get 5 or 7 in this bitwise operation. Yes, we can see the values as 5 and 7. So this is a bitwise operation happening. Similarly, you can also use the shift operations where in case if you're using the this particular kind of representation or this particular kind of representation, they are called bit, they are called uh, left shift and right shift operations. So if you use this in front of a variable, then for example, this one will be shifted here and this zero will be shifted here and this one will be shifted here. So that's how the whole value is going to shift. Whole bits are going to shift one by one towards left. Similarly, if you're using the right shift, then all the bits are going to be shifted towards right by one bit. That's the whole concept of left shift and right shift bitwise operations. And if you want to know more about this, please read some official examples from the Java doc and some other examples available on the internet to build an understanding on this. So this is all I wanted to cover in this lecture. So in the next session, we are going to talk about the control flow statements like if, else, etc. Let's get started with control flow statements. So what are control flow statements and why do we need them? Control flow statements are the ones which can help you control and define the flow of execution in your program. Now, why do we need them? Is because if we want to evaluate some conditions or we want to create some branches of execution saying that if this condition becomes true, do this. And if this condition becomes false, do that. So you can see there are two different branches of execution of a program in this kind of approach. And that's where control flow statements can help us. There are a lot of different types of control flow statements like if then else and switch and for and while and do while and we are going to cover all of them in detail in this series so let's get started with the first one which is the if statement we covered briefly about this when we talked about operators and i promised you guys that i will be covering this in detail and this is the session where we'll be, we will go deeper into this concept as we have already understood that if condition is basically used to evaluate a condition if it is true or false. The result of an if statement will always have only two values. It can either have a true value or it can have a false value. There is no other possibility or there is no other value of an if statement or of an if expression. Now, like I explained, if you want to do a simple uh, programming execution where you say if a particular condition becomes true, do this. And if this becomes false, then do that. It means you need to write this else condition as well, that if this doesn't hold true, what do I do and how do I write that? So let's understand that with the help of an example. For this particular example, I've created a class and there is a public static void main method, which is the entry point of this pr program's execution. I have a variable which is called test score. This is an integer variable with the value 76. And I have a char variable, which is grade. Basically what I'm doing that based on the test score marks, I'm trying to define the grades which a student will get. So for that, I have built a condition here. So you can see it starts with if, which is a keyword. Then you put these standard braces or brackets and you write your condition inside it. In this case, I'm writing the condition saying that if test score is greater than or equal to 90, then the student should get an grade A. So here I've defined this grade variable and here I'm just assigning the value to the grade variable at line 11. If the test score is greater than 90, the grade should be A. But what if the score is not 90? What if this condition becomes false and you want to do something? In that case, you can write this else block here. We call this else block. So you write else as the keyword. You start the curly braces and then you define the grade if the score is not greater than 90, what should be the grade of the student? So in this case, we are saying the grade is F. So if we try to run this example in our, in our mind, we see that the value is of the test score is 76. So 76 is not greater than or equal to 90. So this particular condition 
will not be true. So line 11 will not be executed, but instead else block will be executed because if the condition goes false, then else block should be executed as per Java. So this block will be executed and grade will get a value of F. And then we are printing this grade value by just writing a system.out.println, a string plus the value. So let's run this particular program and see what happens. We get a grade equal to F here in this sysout or system.out.println because this condition was false. So the control, the flow of the control of the program went to line 12 and then to line 30 because this was the else block. So this is one understanding where we can write an if and else logic. You, in some cases, you might not need an else block. So else block is not mandatory. It's an optional block. If you want to remove this and if you just want to do a sysout here, that is also fine. Sysout means system.out.println. For shorthand, we sometimes call it as sysout. So you can do something here as well if you don't need the else block. If you need the else block, feel free to write it, but this is an optional block. But in some cases, your conditions will be more complicated than just a single condition. If you try to understand it from a real world example, in real world, you will not have only two grades as A and F. You will have more grades, right? A, B, C, D, so on and so forth. So what are you going to do in that case? For that kind of case, Java provides us with a keyword, which is called else if. Else if is just a continuation of if, saying that, okay, if this condition doesn't hold true, evaluate the next one with an else if. So I've commented out this code. Let me put this code back into its place, and then we will walk through this code to understand it. Okay, so I have put the code back to where it should be, and this is how it looks like. So let's just walk through this. The line 10 and 11 doesn't change. It's still the same, but then I have added some additional conditions saying that, okay, if the score is greater than or equal to 90, the grade should be A, but if the score is not greater than 90, but greater than or equal to 80, then the grade should be B. Similarly, if the score is not even greater than 80, but greater than or equal to 70, then the grade should be C. Similarly, if the score is not even greater than or equal to 70, but greater than or equal to 60, which means basically between 60 to 70, then the grade should be D. And if the score is even below 60, then the grade should be F. So you can see I have basically defined the whole logic for defining the grades here. And it always works in a top down approach one by one. The way in the sequence in which you will define the else if block will be the sequence in which they will be executed. So after the condition at line 10, and if this condition fails, line 12 will be naturally executed. If this condition also fails, line 14 will be executed and so on and so forth. It will never be the case that if this condition fails, then suddenly line 16 is executed and then again line 12 is executed. It will always work in a line by line fashion. So make sure whenever you are using the else if statements, write it in a sequence in which you want the natural program to be executed. So this is all we have here. And now let's try to run this example. Let me just bring the system.out.println in a line up, save this file, right click, run as Java application. So we see the value is grade equal to C, which means this particular code block was actually executed. Only this condition held true. Now, let, now let's try to understand how this happened. The value was 76. So 76 greater than 90, no this condition becomes false. So line 11 is never executed. It naturally goes to line 12 because that's where we have defined the next else if block. Is 76 greater than or equal to 80? No, it's not. So line 12 condition also becomes false. Line 13 never gets executed and the control shifts to line 14. And there we have the condition saying that is 76 greater than or equal to 70? Yes, this condition is true. So the line 15 gets executed. And once this condition gets true, none of the further conditions will be executed because you only need one true statement, one true execution in the whole if else if block. If that one code block gets true, that code block is executed and then the execution jumps out of the else, uh, if else if blocks. 
and it will directly go to line 22 and it will execute that. Had it been the case that this particular block was also evaluated to false, it would go to line 16. And if this was also false, it would go to the block, which is else block. Let's see that. Let's make this value as 56. So now 56 is not greater than 70. So line 15 will never be executed because this condition will evaluate to false. 56 is greater than 60. No. So this will also be false. And ultimately the grade should fall to else block where we are assigning the grade as F. Let's see. Yes, we get the grade F because ultimately this block was executed because all of the above conditions evaluated to false. So this is all I wanted to cover in this if else if demo. There is another addition of uh, another way of writing if statements, which we call as nested if, where we have an if block inside an if block inside an if block and so on and so forth. How do we write that? And how does the control flows in that kind of an execution? We will cover that in the next session. Let's get started with using nested if statements in Java. Now in the previous lecture, we saw how we can use an if else block and also an if else if else block. But there is another case where we can use these if statements and that is when you have nested if blocks. When would you use it? Let's take an example. Let's say you have multiple conditions to check on a particular program and where the output of the first condition is the input of the second condition and the output of the second condition is the input to the third condition and so on and so forth. If you have that kind of situation, you can write it in a nested if statement kind of block. So let's understand this with the help of an example. As you can see, I have opened an example here, which is about nested if statements. I've created a class which which is named as nested if demo and I have created a public static void main method inside this particular class and now I have declared an integer variable with the value 50 then I'm checking the first condition saying if I equal to equal to 50 if that condition is true then I will check the next condition which is if I is less than 75 and then I am adding one more hypothetical condition saying if this is true then also check if i is less than 55. So you can see if i equal to 50 holds true, then only this condition will be executed. Similarly, if i is less than 75, then only this condition will be executed. So they are dependent upon each other. This condition block is dependent upon the previous block to be true. And this if condition block is dependent upon this if block to be true. If either of these if blocks don't go true, the next subsequent nested if block will not be executed. So in this case, I'm checking it for first equality condition saying if the value is equal to 50, then execute this statement at line number 10. Then check if I is less than 75. If that is also true, execute the statement at line number 12. And then if I is also less than 55, then also execute line number 14. I can also add an else block as well anywhere in this nested hierarchy if I want to. If I add an else block here, that else block will be corresponding to this block. If I add an else block here, then that else block will be corresponding to this if block. And if I add an else block here, then that else block will be corresponding to this particular if block. So you can also use those else if and else blocks as well with nested if blocks and make it as complicated as you want it to be. So that's about this program. And let's see if we run this program, what output do we get? And let's interpret that output. So I've just right click run as Java program and I see some output in the console. First I get I is 50. So line number 10 gets printed because I is 50. Then I also see the next line uh, output as I is smaller than 75. It means this condition was also true because 50 is less than 75. So line 12 also got executed. And then I'm checking if I is less than 55. So yes, 50 is less than 55. So line 14 also gets executed and we get this statement on the console. So this was a simple way to see how we can implement the nested if conditions. Now we are also going to talk about another concept which is used in writing the if conditional blocks, which is called ternary operators. So ternary operators are used as a shorthand of writing if else block. As you can see that these if blocks are quite verbose. We have to write a lot of code to actually write some conditions. In this case, I'm executing three conditions, but the code is almost seven lines or eight lines. So we will see how we can simplify this 
if we use a ternary operator and for that i have created another class which is called ternary operator demo and this particular class again has a public static void main which is the entry point of this particular program and then i have declared couple of variables first is int a equal to 1 and second one is int b equal to 2 I have also declared a result variable and we will see how we can use this result variable. And at line 10, I have written my if else expression. So you can see this if else expression doesn't look like the one which we have seen before. So let's understand how do we write it. If you're trying to write an if else expression with ternary expressions or ternary statements, then the first thing which you need to understand is the structure of it. So here, at first, you will specify the actual condition which you want to test in your if block. So this is my condition. Then after that condition, you're going to put a question mark. And after the question mark, you are going to put the actual result which you want to be executed if this condition becomes true. So if the if condition becomes true, what do you want to do? Whatever is that, you will write it here. And then if the condition becomes false, then the logic should go into the else block and the else logic should come after this colon. So all you need to remember is this question mark and this colon. Before the question mark, you're going to write the condition. After the question mark, you're going to write the statement which is going to be executed if this if condition becomes true. And after the colon, you are going to write the else block condition which is going to be executed if this condition becomes false. Another thing to notice is that ternary operators can be used only in cases when you have only one statement to execute in if block and one statement to execute in else block. It cannot be more than one statements. So instead of this, you can also write system.out.println here, which will also be fine. If I just write this system.out.print, not print f, but I want to write println, so I'll just Right, print ln. You can also do this. This is also fine. You don't need to store the result, obviously. Uh, but but you can also write this condition in a way. But this all this only has to be a single statement. It cannot be more than one statement because this expression can only hold one statement at a time. So use it in situations where you have to check a condition and do something in the if block, which is only one statement, and again one statement in the else block. The same expression can also be written in a verbose if else way in which we have been seeing it before. And we'll also, uh, I will also show that to you. And here, where this a and b is going, this is getting stored in this variable called result. So if this if condition holds true, then the result is a, and this is going to be stored here. And if it is going into the else block, then b is going to be stored in the result block. Let's run this program. So we can see we get the value one because we have set the condition as a less than b. So yes, one is less than two. So this particular statement gets executed and this value gets stored here in the result variable. So that's how you can use the ternary operators to write shorthand if else statements. The same expression can also be written in a verbose way. For example, you can write it in this way saying if a is less than b, then result equal to a else result equal to b this code has exactly the same effect as this one line of code so you can see this is this is pretty uh, simple to write pretty short to write the code which i'm writing here in four lines can be written here in one line and that's the power of ternary operators so this is all i wanted to cover in today's session so we talked about nested if statements and the ternary operators here how to use them in the next session we are going to discuss about switch case statements. Let's get started with using switch statements in Java. So let us first understand why do we need switch statements? Generally, whenever you want to check a condition, you can use an if else block, but what if you have multiple conditions to check? What if you have so many possible execution paths that it becomes too verbose to write it into an if else kind of block? What if you have to check on constant values of certain expressions. How do you do that? It becomes even more challenging and the code becomes even more verbose. So in such cases, switch statement can be used in which you can write switch statement to have as many possible execution paths as you want. And it will work with constant values as well. So let's understand this with the help of an example as how and why will we use the switch statements. So for that, I have created this class, which is called switch demo. And it also has a public static void main method, which is the entry point. 
and in this program what i'm doing is i'm trying to accept a number as the month number in the program and then uh, with that particular number i'm trying to print the corresponding month's name so that's the logic pick a month number and you should get the month's actual name so now in this case you can you can imagine there will be at least 12 if else if blocks which is a long line of if else statements at the same time if we try to do this for other conditions where the value is constant please understand that the value of month is going to be constant it's going to be the same number so it's not similar to you evaluating a condition it's similar to you evaluating a condition to a particular constant value imagine if you have to do some sort of a classification of employees in higher salaries and lower salaries and there are hundreds of salary bands in the company so are you going to write 100 if else logics that is going to take a long time and then what if new bands get new bands get introduced then it gets even more complex so we will use switch case statements in cases where there are lots of if else conditions and the expression evaluates to a constant value remember in the if else cases the expression evaluates to a boolean value so here uh, i'm supplying the month value as 6 then i'm also creating a string month month string variable just to print or store the name of the month and then the way you write the switch statement is to write the switch keyword and then in the brackets you supply the month integer value and then you start writing your conditions so you can see you write the case as keyword and then you write the number or the possible values this particular variable or this particular expression can hold so all the possible values this particular expression can hold will be written individually as cases so case equal to one here one means the value of month is one in that case the month string which we created here shall store january and then we see a statement called break so break is again a keyword in java and this keyword has a special meaning it has a special usage you will use the keyword break to abruptly break the control of execution from the current code block and a code block is identified with curly braces so here you can see the curly brace starts from here and it ends down to line number 51 at here so the moment your java program is going to encounter this particular statement it is going to jump out of the current code block execution and continue thereafter that's the basic logic and usage of break statement so use it whenever you want to skip the rest of the code after the break statement if you don't want to execute the rest of the code you will write break and the moment the java program sees this particular statement it will jump out of the current code block specified by the curly braces and will resume execution after the code block so in this case it will resume the execution after the line 51 that's the usage and uh, meaning of this expression called break so in this case we are saying that if the month value is one which we denoted as here case one then store the value of the month string as january and break out of this particular code block because we don't need to execute any further we have found a match then another case would be if the month value is 2 so you write case which is a keyword and then the exact expression value the constant value which is 2 and if that's the case then month string becomes february and again you break because in this particular case there will only be one condition true at a time there will never be a case that month with the value 2 will have two meanings will have two month names a month with the value two will always have a meaning called february it will never have two meanings or two month names attached to the same integer value and that's why you do not want to execute any further and that's why you write this break statement if you do not write this break statement it is going to evaluate all of the cases one by one even if the cases are not going to be true but it is going to waste a lot of processing time evaluating all the case conditions which you have written here which does not make sense because we know that only one condition at a time can be true here because we are evaluating and checking for a constant value which is an integer value so that's the reason we put a break in each case 
if intentionally if you want to check multiple cases do not put a break statement but the program can become really confusing in that case so take your wise call so here we put a break in each case similarly case 3 the month string becomes march case 4 the month string becomes april case 5 becomes may case 6 becomes june case 7 we have month string as july case 8 month string is august case 9 we store the month string as september case 10 as october case 11 as november and case 12 as december after that you will also see an interesting block called default this is the another capability of switch statement that what if none of the above conditions hold true what if we specify a value which is not between 1 and 12 and it will not match any of the cases which we saw just above and if you want to execute some code in that case if none of the conditions matches you may want to execute some default execution also in such cases you are going to use default default is the code block which will be executed if none of the case matches so here you can see that if none of the cases match then we are going to store the value of month string variable as invalid month and then we'll eventually break out and once we break out of this program we just want to print the month string that's all we are doing in this program that we take an integer value as the month number and then we print the corresponding month name here by looking at the case blocks and we also de define our default case block if none of the conditions hold true so let's run this program we have specified the value as 6 which should result in the month name as june and yes we can see we get june let's change the value and let's put the value as 10 and see what do we get so right click run as java application and we got october yes exactly correct let's put an invalid value as 13 and let's see what happens now now we get invalid month so our default code block just got executed because we entered a value which is not matching any of the case conditions which we have specified so this is how you are going to use the switch and case statements while writing your conditions whenever your condition evaluates to multiple constant values remember the the key here is to understand if your expression is evaluating to multiple constant values which do not change and in those cases using a switch case block is a better idea than writing if else statements so that is all what we are going to cover in today's session and in the next session we are going to understand something about two dimensional arrays and multi dimensional arrays as well let's get started with understanding arrays in detail we have been talking about arrays throughout this course of Java in the previous sessions as well. And we have covered some basic understanding of how to create arrays, how to declare them, how to fill values in the array, and how do we print the array with positions as well as the array as whole. But whatever examples which we took previously were one dimensional arrays because arrays can have more than one dimensions as well. You can create a one dimensional array you can create a two dimensional array you can create even a three dimensional array and you can go up to as many dimensions as you can handle in your java program so it depends upon the kind of complexity you want to have in your program and the kind of values the kind of structure you are going to store in your arrays and based on that need you can choose whether you want to use a 1d array or one dimensional array or a 2d array or a 3d array and so on in these sessions, we are going to talk about 1D arrays, 2D arrays, and 3D arrays. And after that, we'll leave up to you to try out more dimensionals if you want to. We have already covered the basic array structures, which were one-dimensional arrays. So I will just give you a quick walkthrough of how we actually handled one-dimensional arrays. So this is a sample program to demonstrate one-dimensional arrays. If you remember, this is how we used to create arrays. We write the data type of the array. And then we write the square boxes which denote that this is an integer array data type we assign a variable to this and then we initialize the array with the size 4. so new is the keyword which is used to initialize anything in java and we are going to use this heavily when we talk about classes and objects and even collections literally any object which you want to create in java requires a new keyword so here i'm writing new and then int 4 which means create an array of size 4 and then i'm filling the value of the four positions which i have created as part of this array and if you remember 
when we create these kind of arrays, we store them in a zero index based position. The first value gets stored at zeroth index position and then so on and so forth. So it will always start from zero and never start from one. Remember that. And after that, we just print all the values of individual positions of the elements in the array. And if I just run this program, all of the elements of this particular array should be printed one by one. So if I just show the full console of the output, we can see that element and index zero was 10, element and index one was 20, element at index two was 30, and element at index three was 40. So this was just a quick refresher of how one dimensional arrays can be written. And whenever you declare a very simplistic array, it will generally be a one dimensional array. Now let's look at the two dimensional arrays and how do we write them? When do we need them? For that, I have created another example, which is says two dimensional array. I just created a class and it has a public static void main method and I've created a two dimensional array this time. So let's understand this two dimensional array in a bit detail. And when do we need that? Generally, you would need to use two dimensional arrays whenever you are trying to do any matrix calculations. If you if you understand what do we mean by matrix, it's basically a two by two structure which stores the values in the form of rows and columns. So imagine a table of two rows and two columns, then it will be a two by two matrix. So if you want to store that particular table in a Java program, you would need to store that as a matrix, as a two dimensional matrix, rows being the one dimensional and column being the other dimension. And that's what we are doing here. And if you want to store that 2D matrix in a Java program, the approach and the procedure for it is pretty similar to how you create a one dimensional array with slight changes. The first change is instead of a single square bracket, you're going to write two square brackets because it is a two dimensional array. So remember the number of square brackets you are going to put while initializing and declaring the array is the number of dimensions which your array is going to have. Since this is a two dimensional array example, that's why you see two brackets here. If this was a three dimensional array example, you will see three, array, three square brackets here and so on and so forth. So that's the first part of it. Second part to understand is to how to store the data. Remember I told you always imagine the structure of rows and columns whenever you are trying to store a two dimensional array in Java. So what are rows and what are values and how do you represent them while you declare and initialize a two dimensional array? So you start with the curly braces as a normal 1D array, but inside the curly braces, you create nested curly braces blocks. We can see three blocks here. They start with their own curly brace and end with their own. Then this curly brace starts here and ends here. And then this curly brace starts here and ends here. Idea is that you provide this outer curly braces to define the overall structure. And then inside each of the curly braces is going to represent a row in your two dimensional array. So each of these values, these blocks is going to represent a row. So I can say that this is the first row, this is the second row, and this is the third row. And if I try to visualize it in terms of columns, then this is the first row, first column, first row, second column, first row, third column. Similarly, second row, first column, second row, second column, second row, third column, and third row, first column, third row, second column, and third row, third column. So individual values are going to be represented as columns and the whole curly braces is going to be represented as arrays. That's the basic mental idea or mental image you should have while declaring a two dimensional arrays. Remember to declare the rows inside the nested curly braces and whatever elements you have will automatically be indexed as columns. Another thing to remember that since this is an array data structure, everything starts from zero and nothing starts from one. So this will be row zero, this will be row one, and this will be row two. I'm talking about the position. We can still call it as first row, second row, and third row, but the position of this particular row element is zero. The position of this particular row element is one, and this particular row element is two. Similarly for column as well, this is column zero, column one, and column two. Similarly, column zero, column one, and column two, and so on and so forth. Once you understand this data structure well 
and you have defined it correctly, then everything should fall in place. If you want to do a matrix addition or if you want to do a matrix multiplication or a dot product, all of the kind of calculations can be performed using the 2D array concept. Here in this program, what I'm doing is I am printing the values of this particular 2D array into a matrix style. And you see some strange code here, which is for etc. Don't worry about this. I'm going to cover in detail what this for means and how do you write this. For now, what we can understand that we just want to print this. You might not need to print this in your Java programs when you write a production grid application, but you might want to do manipulations on these uh, arrays as metrics. Maybe you want to create a transpose of a matrix or you want to do a dot product or addition or subtraction or whatever be your use case. In this case, just for demonstration purpose, I'm printing the values as rows and columns, nothing else. So this all of this code from line eight to line 14, or in fact, line 13 is just showing how to print the values. You can see some system dot out and you can see some construct here. And like I said, don't worry about this. I will cover this in detail. Let's run this program and see if my Java array is stored correctly and how can I represent this? So you can see I have represented it in a style of a 2D matrix where this is the first row, this is the second row, and this is the third row. Similarly, this is the first column containing the value 237. So column zero will have value two and uh, column one will have this value three and column two will have this value seven for row zero. Let me also do something here which can help you understand this concept better. Let me do a system.out.println and let's print an individual value because like I said, the for loop can be confusing here to understand. So let's say I want to print ARR of zeroth row first column and see what kind of values do we get. Let me comment this code. Comment is control backslash and this code will be commented and this code will not be executed. And now only line 15 will be executed instead of the four block. So if I run this, I get the value seven. So row zero and first column, row zero, first column is seven. Let's try with one one. I want to print the row at zero, one position. Remember not the first row, but the one position row, which is basically technically the second row. So second row, second column and see what kind of values value do I get in this case? I get six. So second row, second column. Similarly, if you change this value to two, then third row, second column, which should point to four. Yes, we get four. Similarly, you can write a value here as zero and you can write a value here as let's say two. This will print the zeroth row and the second column. So similarly, whatever kind of value you want to write you or you want to access, you can access it in this fashion. And remember the column and row indexes will always start from zero. So this is a simple demonstration of how you can use two dimensional arrays. And in this session, we also did a refresher of one dimensional arrays. So that's all for this session. And in the next session, we are going to be discussing how we can define three dimensional arrays and we'll also see an example of it. Let's get started with how to create and use a three dimensional array or how to go about using multi dimensional arrays in Java. So as you can see from this image, we talked about 1D array, which is having just one axis. Then we talked about 2D arrays in the last session where we had rows and columns basically an X axis and a Y axis. And then we can also have a 3D array, which will have three axes, which will have an X axis, a Y axis, and also a Z axis. Think of a simple box, which uh, every box in this world will always have at least three dimensions. And from, from here, you can go even build more complex arrays, which can have four dimensions or five dimensions or as many dimensions as you want it to have. And today we are going to look at an example of how can we build a 3D array and how do we access those elements. But this picture is just to show you the mental model of when you will be creating a 3D array. So for example, generally an image data is stored in, in three dimensions. So you can, you might want to store the image data into a 3D array. And there can be many other use cases in the mathematical and research computational use cases where you might want to use a 3D array. So, but remember there's an X axis, there's a Y axis, and then there's a third axis, which is called the Z axis. So 
let us look at a Java program to understand how we can build a three-dimensional array. And for that, I have created this class which is called multi-dimensional array. It has a entry point method, which is the public static void main method. And then I have created an integer array. And this time, instead of one or two square brackets, I have three square brackets. And if you remember, I mentioned this in the previous session as well. The number of square brackets which you're going to put while initializing the array is the number of dimensions of the array. And since in this particular program, I'm going to demonstrate a three dimensional array. That's why you see three square box boxes. Let me just minimize this. Yep. So we have three square boxes here and we have created the variable name as ARR or short form as array. Then we start with the outermost curly braces as is. Then we put another curly braces which starts from here and it ends here. Then another set of curly brace which starts from here and end here. So this is the this is the first dimension. This is the second dimensions and these are the third dimensions. That's how you're going to define the different dimensions. Remember this is the first dimension when the first curly brace starts. Then you have the second dimension which covers this hole and this hole and then you have third dimension which are these. So that's how you're going to visualize and and put the three dimensions in use while declaring a three dimensional array and the values work in the same fashion. It's it's a zero index based position. So since we do not have an official name for the third dimension, so I'm just going to use X axis, Y axis and Z axis to refer to the three axes. So this would be X of zero. This would be Y of zero and this would be Z of zero. Similarly, X of one, Y of one and Z of one and so on and so forth. So now if I try to access the value which is at zeroth X position, first Y position and second Z position, what's the value do we get here? Let's run this program and understand and interpret the output. Okay, uh, so when we ran this program, we got the output as 11. So let's understand this output. So when we say the zeroth position on X, the first position on Y and the second position on Z. So this is the zeroth position on X and this is the first position on Y and then this element is 0, 1, 2 is the second position on the Z axis. So to, to describe it in a nutshell, this defines the X axis. So we have two elements on the X axis here, this one and this one. Then we have two elements on the Y axis on each X axis. So this is one, this is two on the first X axis and this is one and this is two on the second Y, uh, second X axis. So two X and two Y and then on the Z axis, I have three elements each. So hope this helps you understand and visualize this. So X axis and this one is other X axis and then Y axis, Y axis and then in elements inside this are Z axis. So I'm saying zero with X axis in this block first on the Y axis, which is this block and then second element or the Z or second position element on this particular axis in this particular block, which is 11. And that's why we get 11. If I print zero, let's say I, I change this particular value as one. So now the output should be coming from this side. So second X position because it's one second Y position. So this will go here and then the two position, which is the third element of the Z axis, which is 13. So let's see if we get 13. Yes, we get 13 here. So this is just to show you how you can interpret this particular array and always be mindful of how you are structuring this array. If your structure is gone wrong, then your program will become useless and it will give you a lot of unpredictable outputs, which might not make sense and which may introduce errors in your program. So be very careful how you define the structure of the elements here that's the key and after that you just need to understand the x axis the y axis and the z axis always remember all the axes start from zero so when i say two i'm basically referring to the third element and not the second element so this is all i wanted to cover in this particular session where we describe how we can use a three-dimensional array and from here you can go to any lens like i said you can add more square brackets here 
and go to four dimension or five dimension or six dimension. But remember, the more dimensions you add, the more complexity of the program will be having. The program will become more and more difficult to debug and understand. So always try to take a wise call as to how many dimensions you want to use in your array. And that's it for this particular session. In the next session, we are going to talk about the different loop statements in Java. Let's get started with today's topic, which is about how to use do while loops. Now in the previous session, we covered the usage of while loops, but we have another type of while loop, which is called a do while loop. So let's understand when do we need that and how do you actually use that? Let me switch to the Java documentation and if I can find some syntax of it as well. Yep. So as you can see here, if I just highlight this portion, this is how you actually write a do while statement block. So you write do, you start a code block, you write some executable statements, and then after the code block ends, you write a while expression and end it with semicolon. This is the syntax basically. It starts with do or, or curly braces, some executable statements, a while block or a while statement basically with an expression ending with a semicolon. Let's understand this with the help of a program to understand the structure better. So for this, I have created a sample program here, which is called do while demo. Again, having a public static void main method and it has a variable which is count and it is initialized as one. Then I write do, I write this code block or the curly braces. And then I am just printing the value of count. Then I am incrementing the value of count. And then I am writing a condition which says while count is less than 10 and semicolon. If you compare this with the previous demo we ran, if I just put them side by side, we had while condition statement and, and, the, and the state change condition. Here we have do statement, condition change statement, and then we check the condition at the end. So the idea is that if you have a use case where before you even evaluate the condition, you want to print something even before you evaluate the condition. If you want to do something in that case, you will use the do while loop even before the while actual while loop starts. If you want to execute a statement, you will use do while loop. For example, if you want to print the initial value of the count even before the condition checks, then you can use do while loop. If that is not your use case, you can use a simple while loop, which is described here in this program. So coming back to the do while, so I say do, and then I'm saying print this particular statement without checking anything. This condition will be executed for the first time without any condition check at all. This will just work as is like a normal Java statement. After that, I'm incrementing the value of the count and then I'm checking the condition. So remember when this particular condition is being checked, the first increment has already happened. But in the while case, we did the comparison before even the first increment. The first comparison happened with the original value of count. But here, the first comparison is happening with the incremented value of the count. Hope you get the difference in a better context now that you will use this when you want to do some, write some initialization code before you actually hit the condition. So this condition will be evalu evaluated with two less than 10 and then the value will be printed. Let's print this example and we'll also try to play around with this example a bit more to bring uh, to build our understanding better. If I run this program, there is no difference in output if you compare this with the previous program we ran for the while. So it prints the count value. So this is coming here. Then it increments the value. Then it checks the condition saying is two less than 10. Yes, that holds true. If that holds true, it will go back to statement number nine. Again, print this again, do an increment on the count and again, check the condition with the updated value of the count, which will say three less than 10. Now, similarly, print the value increment check. This will continue to happen till this particular condition becomes false. And once this condition is false, it will exit out of this whole do while loop and it will go to the line number 12. And if you have any statement written there, you can uh, that statement will be executed in this case. So let's try to change some values here and let's see if, if, if we can make sense of this program. If we change the value, let's say if I put 11 here, what will happen now? Let's run this program. You will say the 
now you will see that this particular output is displayed which says count is 11. So what happened here, the count was 11, it entered the do while block, it went to this particular statement which said count is 11, then it incremented the value. So the value became 12 and obviously 12 is not less than 10. So it did not print it again. It only printed once, even if the first time the condition was checked, the first condition execution itself resulted in false. Still line number nine got successfully printed. And that's the whole, that's the whole idea behind using the do while. What if I change this value to 10? Let's see what happens. And after that, we'll run one more combination to just make it more interesting. This time again, count is 10. Line number 10 will be printed as count is 10. Then at line number 10, the count is incremented to 11 and 11 is not less than 10. So in this case, the loop ends and it will move out. Now, what happens if I do this? If I say less than equal to here, let's run this program and interpret the output. Now, again, only one statement is printed because in this case, the count is 10, 10 is printed here, and we are saying 10 plus one, 11, 11 is still not less than equal to 10. And that's why the loop just exits. Let's make it nine and see what happens. Now you see two values. So count is nine. It enters the do while loop, goes to statement number nine, prints the current value of count, which is nine, then increments the value to 10. Then at line number 11, this while statement is executed and the condition is checked. Is 10 less than equal to 10? Yes, 10 is not less than, but 10 is equal to 10. So this condition will hold true. It will go back here, print count is 10, make count 11. Again, check the condition is 11 less than equal to 10. No, it's not. And then the condition will return to false and loop will be exited. So hope this will give you a better understanding now since we ran different permutations and combinations of the values and we saw when this will be executed and when this will not be executed. But the bottom line is very straightforward that whenever you want to write some pre-processing logic even before checking the very first condition of your loop then in that case you will be using a do while loop otherwise a normal while loop or a for loop will have absolutely work fine so that's the takeaway i would like you to take away from this particular session and that's all for this particular session we talked about do while and we also tried to give you some sort of a comparison between while loops and do while loops in the next session we are going to be discussing about for loops in detail. Let's get started with understanding the loop statements in Java. So first of all, understand why do we need loop statements? So generally, whenever you are dealing with some data structures in Java, which can store multiple elements, for example, we saw array, which can store multiple elements. String is also basically technically a character array, which is storing multiple characters. So whenever you have these kind of data structures where you have multiple elements being stored in the same uh, then in that case you would like to have a way to iterate or access all of the elements in a seamless fashion. One of the ways is to access them individually one by one but that's too much of work. That's too much of code. There has to be a simpler way of accessing all the elements one by one if I want to and that's where the majority of the use cases for using loops coming to picture. Now Java provides multiple constructs to write loops in Java. There is a while loop, there is a do while loop, there is a for loop, there is also an enhanced for loop. And in the previous versions of Java, a use case of iterator was also very popular. So there are multiple ways in which you can actually iterate over a collection and access all the elements of the collection one by one and you can use it to multiple useful cases for example if you have a huge array of employee salary and you want to give bonus to each of the employees and add the bonus to the salary then you need to do this addition for all the employees it would be nice to have to return a while loop and the while loop can automatically access all the employee salary one by one and keep adding the bonus to the salary. This would be an easier way to do this rather than individually updating each employee's salary. And the first loop statement we are going to understand is a while loop. So the syntax of while loop is very straightforward. You write the while keyword 
you enter the actual condition which will be evaluating to a boolean true or false so you write the expression which will be a boolean expression exactly similar to the conditions which you uh, use to write in your if statements so you write your condition which will evaluate to either true or false and then you write your statement and these statements will keep executing till the time this particular expression evaluates to true so generally the way it works is that it will enter the while block it will evaluate the expression if the expression becomes true then the statements inside this particular while block will be executed and after the uh, execution of the statement it will again go back again evaluate the expression we call them steps basically so it will go to the next step again evaluate the expression if this again if this still holds true it will again go inside execute the statement move on to the next step it will again go to the evaluation so this this loop will continue to go till the time this condition will hold true if it still doesn't make sense for you don't worry we will have a demo of it to make you understand how to use the while loops and maybe it's a good idea to switch to the ide and look at an example of it so i have already created while demo for it here it is it looks very small and simple but it will get to the point where we can understand how and why will be will we be using the while loops so i've created a while demo class i've added a public static void main method here which is the entry point i have declared a variable which is int count equal to 1 so the count value is 1 right now and then i'm writing a condition here i'm saying while count is less than 10 do this so it will print the current value of count and after that i'm using the post increment unary operator if you remember we covered this in the previous sessions what is the meaning of this it basically will increment the value of count by 1 this expression is e is equivalent to if i write it in this way if i write count equal to count plus 1 this is exactly the same as this no difference so this will have the same impact i will just remove this line because we already have the count plus plus here so if we try to understand this we are basically incrementing the count and then checking the condition again so at first time it will be 1 less than 10 yes that is true it will go inside and print the count value the current count value which will be 1 and then it does count plus plus so now the count value becomes 2 it will again go back here again check the condition saying is 2 less than 10 yes that is true so the while condition again becomes true it will again go inside this print the current value of count which is 2 then do count plus plus so it will again increment the value of count so the now the count value becomes 3 again go back here at condition and saying is 3 less than 10 yes that is still true again come here print the 3 again go here make count as 4 4 less than 10 prints 4 again count plus plus count becomes 5 and so on so forth it will keep doing that till the value becomes 10 so at a step when count plus plus results in the count value being updated to 10 it will go here and say is 10 less than 10 now that is not true because 10 is equal to 10 but 10 is not less than 10 so this condition will become false and it will exit of this while loop and it will come here and it will execute if there's if there was anything written after the while loop that will be executed so that's the idea that you want to do something till a particular condition holds true then you can use the while loop define your condition and execute the statements and try to do something which changes the state of this condition here i'm changing the count so that every time a new evaluation happens if i comment this this will result in an infinite loop because 1 will always be less than 10 i will not be incrementing the count here and it will keep running forever it will never stop it will just keep printing 1 1 1 every time till your computer program runs out of the memory so always remember not to end up into an infinite loop that's probably one of the biggest mistakes any beginner programmer does so please try to be aware of that particular uh, loophole not try to run an infinite loop always try to write something in the code block which can change the state of the condition and also make sure that that state condition sometimes sometime should become false you should also make sure that that always that always becomes false because if i do this if i do this then this condition will always remain true because it is already 1 then it will become 0 then it will become minus 1 minus 2 minus 3 so on so forth but that value of count will forever be less than 10 
and again you will never be able to exit this loop your program will be stuck in this loop till your program runs out of the memory so always remember to write a, a statement or a, a statement of execution in your in your code block which can change the state of the condition which results in some eventual time when this condition becomes false this condition has to become false eventually otherwise you will never come out of the loop always remember that so if we run this program now let's observe the output so we can see here this particular statement is printed for one two three four five six seven eight nine and that's it after nine the moment the count plus plus resulted into the count value becoming 10 it checked that condition and then it just came out of the loop because 10 is not less than 10 and the condition became false so always do something inside your code block which results at least of one scenario where this condition becomes false and that is how you can use the while loop now you can see this is a pretty generic code and you can write any kind of condition here write any code you want to execute here and then do something to change the state of the condition as well in a positive way in a way which results this particular condition to be false at some point of time and then your while loop will run fine so this is all i wanted to cover in terms of the while loop we have a lot of more exciting stuff coming in in terms of different loops and in the next session we are going to understand how our do while loop works let's get started with for loops in java so so far we covered about while loops and do while loops and we also saw different examples of using different types of data structures like arrays but one of the core requirements whenever you are working with any kind of collection is to iterate over it exactly similar to what i explained in the do while and while lectures that you would often require to iterate over a collection or a data structure and for that one of the most sophisticated and easiest way to do that is using for loops so let's understand the syntax of for loop first and then we will also look at an example of it in the in the eclipse ide so i have just opened the official java docs here so if you see this is basically the syntax of a for loop statement so let's understand it and let's also try to compare it with a while loop so that we can understand how it compares with the while loop so if we see the syntax we first see the term initialization then we see the term termination and then we see the term called increment now if i try to compare it with a while loop there also you basically did these three things you first initialized a variable outside the while loop which is called initialization and then you wrote a condition which is your termination condition you wrote a condition saying let's say while i is greater than 10 or while i is less than 10 so that is the condition which is also the termination statement the loop will continue to execute till that condition evaluates to false and that's when the loop terminates that's why we call it as termination and then the third piece of it is the increment the i plus plus which we used to do in the while loops so these three portions together make or constitute any kind of loop in any kind of programming language and for loop if you see the the kind of code which you use to write in a while loop in multiple lines where you first initialize a variable then you write a condition in the while block and then inside the while block you use to increment the variable all of that can be done in a single line in the for loop and that's why i said it it is the most sophisticated and easiest way to write loops in java so you write all of these three things the initialization the condition and the increment or decrement values in the single line and then you start with the curly braces and you write the code which you want to keep executing till the condition evaluates to false that's the basic syntax of it so let us try to understand this with the help of an example so here i have opened a class which is called for demo and this is a class which will demonstrate the usage of a for loop so again we have a public static void main method which you can see here which is the entry point and then i use the keyword for i put standard uh, braces or the brackets and then i do the initialization so this part is the initialization part you initialize the variable so i just say int i equal to one initialization done you end it with a semicolon so that it is a single statement understood by java and then you write this condition which is your evaluation slash termination condition 
So this condition is basically the, the deciding factor of how long your loops should run. It's exactly similar to what you used to write in the while block. If I just show you the example, this is what we used to do. So we did the initialization at line number seven. Then we wrote this termination condition inside the while uh, syntax or the construct. And then we did the increment here. So we are doing all of these three steps, but we are doing it in a single line. So this is the condition. And then we write our increment or decrement uh, values, which are going to change the uh, evaluation condition every time at every step. So we are saying I plus plus. So technically what I am saying here is that start with I equal to one and then check the condition I less than 10. So in the, in the, in the first step, it will be checking if one is less than 10. If the condition holds true, go inside the for loop, execute the statement at line number seven, and then go back to this particular statement. So we do I plus plus. So I becomes two, and then you again go back to the condition. And again, you check if two is less than 10. Yes, it is. So again, you go inside, inside the for loop and do whatever is written there. There can be multiple statements here. For now, I have just written one system.out.println. So that happens. And once all the execution is finished inside the block, it will again go back to the increment. Does the increment, so two plus one becomes three. Again, does the evaluation, and if the, if the condition holds true, it will again go inside. So this will continue. This condition checking, execution, and increment will continue till the time this condition holds true. The moment this condition becomes false, the control will come out at line number nine. So that's the basic anatomy and control flow. It's very important to understand the control flow of a for loop. Otherwise, you might end up into a program which is forever running and which will just eat up all the memory available in your JVM. So be very sure of what you write in your for loop. Be very sure of especially these two parts, the condition and the increment or decrement. So this is very important piece. The initialization happens only once. And then this condition evaluates. If the condition holds to true, some code executes, goes back to the changing statement, which can be an increment, decrement, whatever. And again, compares the updated value with the condition. So this will keep happening. Let's run this code to interpret the output. So I will right click, go to run as Java application. And if I interpret the output here, I can see that it started with count is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. It stopped at nine. So what happened there? Let's try to evaluate the termination condition. So let's say I has become nine and nine is less than 10. So it goes inside and it prints count is nine, which is I, then it goes here and it says nine plus one. I plus plus means nine plus one, the current value of I plus one, it becomes 10. And then it again compares the condition. So now 10 is not less than 10. 10 is equal to 10, but it is not less than 10. So the condition becomes false and count is 10 is never printed because this condition has become false. It will jump out. So let's say if I do this, if I put an equal to here, and if I now execute the same program, this time I will see 10 here. And because I have said that, okay, check the condition if 10 is less than or equal to 10, that will become true. It will print count is 10, then it will increment and the count will become 11. The I will become 11 and then it will check 11 is less than or equal to 10. No, it is not. So condition becomes false and the control comes out of the loop. So that's how you should always try to interpret the loops. You can also run some infinite loops, for example, if I say I equal to one, I leave it that and I say I minus minus. So what happens? I equal to one, one is less than 10. Yes, it goes here, prints the value. And then I decrement the value. I don't increment the value. I decrement the value. So whatever value comes out will always be less than 10. And this loop will run forever. For fun, let's try to run this and I will, I will have to kill this program manually, but just to show you what happens and what you should not do in your, in your Java program. So you see, it will continuously keep printing the values till the program runs out of memory, till it eats up all the available memory. It is, it is forever running. It will never stop because the condition will never remain, never, never evaluate to false. This condition will forever be true. So the loop will run forever. So I'm just going to kill the program, but this is something which you should avoid whenever you are writing Java code. And this happens quite often with beginner programmers. So this is all I wanted to cover in today's session. 
we talked in detail about the for loop and in the next session we are going to talk about another interesting way of writing for loops which is also called enhanced for loops let's get started with enhanced for loops in java so we covered about the for loops and the structure of it and the control flow of it in the previous session and today we are just going to talk about another way of writing for loops which is a bit even more smarter than the traditional for loops which we call as enhanced for loops we generally use the enhanced for loops for scenarios whenever we have to iterate over a collection of items or an array of items those are the most popular and common use cases of using enhanced for loop and this for loop is even simpler like i said it's even simpler than uh, writing a classic for loop and the syntax is simply like this you again start with for put the standard brackets and then let's start from the rightmost because then at i will be able to explain it better you specify the collection in the rightmost side of the bracket the collection can be an array it can be a list it can be a map so whatever different kind of collections which are available in java and we are going to cover collections in detail so don't worry if you don't understand what are lists and what are maps and what are sets we will go into detail of each of these one by one in the upcoming sessions but the idea is that you put the collection to the rightmost then you put a colon and then you put a representation of the member of this collection so for example here this numbers is basically an int array so this int array means that this array can only hold integer numbers and that's why we write int here because this array is only having integers then we put any placeholder variable name this can be anything you can even write it as i if you want to you can write it as anything any variable name which you want to write this is a temporary variable so now this code is going to execute in a manner that it is going to iterate over this array one by one starting from the first element going till the last element you don't need to write any initialization code you don't need to write any termination condition code and you don't need to write any increment or decrement code also and how these three uh, how these three values are actually taken care of let's understand that as well so when we talk about the initialization as i have put an array here a data structure here the automatic initialization index is going to be the first index so when we do the iteration when this for loop is going to execute it is automatically going to initialize a temporary variable with the value at the first index which is the index 0 as you know that array is a zero index based structure then comes the condition part so the condition evaluation is going to be again based on the size of the array or the size of the data structure which you are using it is going to start from the first index which is the index 0 and it is going to iterate till the array's last element is reached so technically start from the index 0 and go till the last element that's your evaluation condition and then comes the increment part so at each step after it has successfully accessed the first element automatically the index is going to be updated to pointing to the next element so if it starts from here once the first step iteration is complete i is automatically going to be incremented to index 1 and then it will basically this i will be holding 2 then in the next iteration the same i is going to be holding 3 similarly i will keep holding the new value of the collection item one by one till the collection items last element is reached so this is the basic premise that you can write a collection variable here and keep iterating over it and this whatever variable you write here will hold the current items value one by one so in the first step this i is going to hold one in the second step this i is going to hold two in the third step this i is going to hold 3 and so on so forth that's the basic idea so now let's run this program to see what kind of output do we get so you can see we basically are able to print all the elements of the array and that's probably one of the most popular usage as well that if you want to just print all the elements or access all the elements of a array or a collection one by one 
then just use enhanced for loop. So you can see at each step, it is printing the value of i. And the value of i is basically the subsequent elements of the array. That's the whole idea with enhanced for loop. Under the hoods, if you talk about how does it work under the hood, it is actually using the classic for loop construct itself. But for developers, it is making it easier because it knows that if you are iterating over a collection, you will start with the first element and you will go till the last element. So it knows the initialization value, the termination condition, and it also knows the increment condition. And that's the reason you will use enhanced for loops in Java for iterating over collections. And in the next session, we will be talking about the nested for loops concept and we will be looking at an example of how to implement nested for loops and when do we use nested for loops. Let's get started with nested for loops in Java. So we talked about the while loops, the do while loops, the classic for loop, also the enhanced for loop. So now we are going to look at a variation of the classic for loops in a, in a condition where we have to use more than one loop in a nested fashion. And how do we do that? What are the use cases when we use that? So in front of you, you can see an example which I have prepared for nested for loops. And in this particular example, I have created a two dimensional array. As you can see on the line number six, I have created an integer array and I have put two square brackets here, which are basically symbolizing that this is a two dimensional array. So this two dimensional array is going to hold technically a 2D matrix. And we are going to use the concept of nested for loops to print this 2D array in a 2D matrix style where you will be able to see the rows and columns clearly. Let's first try to inter uh, interpret this particular uh, 2D array. So we have a curly braces outside and then we have these three inner elements which symbolizes three rows basically. So this is the first row. This is the second row and this is the third row. And then each of the rows have three elements each, which symbolizes the column values or the item values. So it's basically a three into three 2D array, which has three rows and three columns. So, so we can say that this is basically a three into three array, which has three dimensions on the row side and three dimensions on the column side, or just a three by three matrix or three by three 2D array. So as we know that in case of arrays, everything starts from zero. So technically, if we talk about the indexes, it would be the index zero, index one, and index two on the row side. And similarly, index zero, index one, and index two on the column side. So that's, that's something which you should remember because we are going to use this particular concept when we write the for loop. So let's try to write the for loop now. If you look at line number eight, we put this keyword called for, and then we write the initialization. So we say int i equal to zero. Then we are writing the termination condition, and we are saying run, run this particular loop, run this whole loop, which ends at line 13, till i is less than three, and keep incrementing i at every step. That's what I'm doing in the line number eight. Then inside the for loop, I'm writing another for loop, which has another different variable called j. It can be anything, you can name it anything you want. And this also starts with zero. And this also has a similar condition, which is which says run this particular loop, the line 10 basically, or this loop, which is signified by this curly braces, run this particular loop till the time the value of j is less than three and keep incrementing j at every step. And at line number 10, print the element of array, which has the current value of i and the current value of j. These are basically the positions. These are not the elements. The element would be represented by this whole, but print the element which is at current i and j's position values. That's what this code means. So let's try to do a dry run on this particular code to understand how this is going to work. So at first we have i equal to zero. Zero is less than three and it goes inside. It initializes j as well with zero and j is zero is also less than three. So this condition went true. That's why we went to line number nine and line number nine condition also went to true. So we went to line number 10. Remember that in this particular case at line number 10, the values of i and j are zero and zero respectively. And we are saying 
print the array of 0 and 0. So 0th rows, 0th column element should be printed. So this is the 0th row because this is the first, uh, first sub block and this is the first element. So in this case, in line number 10, 2 should get printed. Then it goes here and it increments the j to 1. So 0 plus 1 becomes 1. It again checks the condition is 1 less than 3. So yes, 1 is less than 3. It goes here. Remember, it did not go up at line number 8. It just came back from line number 9. So when it comes here, i is still 0, but j has moved from 0 to 1. So now we are trying to access the element which is at 0th row, first column, which is going to be 7. So 7 is going to get printed. Similarly, on the next iteration, j is going to get incremented from 1 to 2. And again, the condition will be evaluated. So 2 is less than 3. All good. It will again come back to line number 10. And now it will say print the value of 0 row, third or the second column or the third element. So 0th row, third element, which is the 9. So 9 will get printed. Then again, j will be incremented and j will become 3, 2 plus 1, 3. And now the condition will be evaluated. Is 3 less than 3? No, it is not less than 3. The condition becomes false. So it breaks out of the loop, goes to line number 12, prints an empty line because we are not writing anything here. So it will just print a blank line. And now it will go back to line number 8's condition and it will do an increment of i. And now i will move from 0 to 1. And now the evaluation will happen. Is 1 less than 3? Yes, 1 is less than 3. So it will again go to line number 9. Again, initialize j with a fresh 0. The previous j got destroyed the moment you came out of the loop. So this is a new j. So this j again gets initialized to 0. 0 is less than 3. It goes here. Remember, i was 1 in this time. So now it will print the value of this 2D array, which is sitting at 1, 0. Basically, second row, first element. So second row, first element, which is 3. Again, j is going, going to get incremented and it will become from 0 to 1. So 1 is less than 3. Yes, it will again come here and it will print the value of the array, which is sitting at array of 1, 1 for a row equal to 1 and column equal to 1, which will be 6. Similarly, j will get incremented again. Again, 2 is less than 3. Come back here, we'll print 1. Then again, we'll increment j. J will become 3. 3 is less than 3. No, it's false. The condition is false. So it jumps out of the loop, goes to line number 12, prints a blank line, again goes back to 8, line number 8, increments i, and i now becomes 2. 2 is less than 3. Yes, it will again go here, initialize j again with 0, and again does the same thing for the row 2 and column 0, 1, 2. And again, it will come out of the loop. This time, again, when it will go here, the value will become from 2 to 3 and 3 is not less than 3. So then it will break out of the outer loop. So the idea is execute the inner loop for every value of the outer loop. Remember this line because that is how you will be applying your knowledge of nested for loops to be used in certain condition. So whenever you have a scenario where you have to iterate over a collection based on a certain value of another collection, then you can use nested for loops or you have a scenario where you have to iterate over 2D or 3D arrays. For example, if we were dealing with 3D arrays, then you would have seen three nested for loops here and where it will apply the same logic that iterate over all the collections, all the values of the inner loop on a particular value of the outer loop. Then increment the value of the outer loop and do the same thing again. Iterate over all the values of the inner loop based on a fixed value of the outer loop. So let's run this program and let's see what kind of output do we get. So like I said, our, our motive, our target was to print this in a, in a matrix style. And you can see that it is printing in a, it in a sort of a matrix representation. So the first row gets printed here, then the second row gets printed here, and then the third row gets printed here. If you try to decipher it, it will work exactly the same way as I explained. So i equal to 0, 0 less than 3, condition becomes true, comes here j equal to 0, j less than 3, condition becomes true, comes here, prints the array of 0, 0, which is 2, then prints the uh, array of 0, 1, which is 7, 0, 2, which is 9, then j becomes 3, it breaks out of the loop, goes up here, 
i becomes from 0 to 1 1 is less than 3 yes again comes here reinitializes a fresh for loop with a new j setting to 0 and it will it will print the array of 1 0 1 1 1 2 then similarly array of 2 0 2 1 2 2 so that's basically what we are doing we are iterating we are picking the first row and iterating all elements of it picking the second row iterating all all elements over it and so on and so forth you can do this for any n dimensional kind of array or a collection so this is all i wanted to cover in today's session where we discussed about the nested for loops concept and how and where we will use it and in the next session we will be discussing about the java collections framework let's get started with collections in java or the collections framework in java i must say that this is probably the most important concept of the java programming language which you will be using heavily whenever you are working in any production grade application so let's understand the collections framework and the different classes and the utilities available inside the collections framework this is going to be a theoretical lecture because there is a lot of ground to cover in this lecture so we will only focus on understanding the relationship between the classes why those classes are created because each class has a different purpose in this framework and we will ob obviously talk about the hierarchy as well in the upcoming sessions we will go into the hands-on exercise of some of the most popular collections we will not be able to provide hands-on of all the collections classes which you which you can see on the screen because then it is going to take a very very long time to complete this concept but we will cover the most popular ones or the most used ones out of this particular framework so let's get started as you can see there, let's first understand some of the symbols here and let me just zoom this in a bit so that it's visible yep now though i have just increased the resolution a bit so you can see there are three different symbols or legends here you see this oval shape which is called interface so you can see some interfaces here then you see this uh, rectangular blue box which is called abstract class and you can see some of these blue boxes and then you see the purple box which is called the class and you see some classes here these ones so for now we are currently we haven't covered the concept of interfaces and abstract classes but we will cover that in the coming lectures and for understanding the collections hierarchy right now the at least the concepts of it you don't need to be fully aware of the concept of interfaces or abstract classes so let's dive deeper into the framework iterable is basically an interface uh, to, to give you a very simple definition of an interface interface basically is sort of a declaration which will tell you what kind of classes will be present under the interface for example if you have to let's say store all the cars and all the bikes and all the bicycles and all the trucks from all around the world then you can create an interface called vehicle and create all of these classes under the interface and these classes will be about cars about trucks and about other kind of vehicles so an interface is a generic blueprint of specific class implementation that's a very simple definition of an interface and like i said we will go deeper into this concept in the upcoming lectures so that was about interfaces similarly when we talk about abstract classes the next legend here abstract classes are also similar to interfaces where they provide you a generalization but at the same time abstract classes provide you a way to also write some concrete implementation for example if we take the example of a bank account so there in a bank you have different kinds of accounts you have savings accounts you have recurring accounts you have current accounts and there are many other different types of accounts so there would be some common implementation and logic which will be applicable to all the account types for example an account must have an account holder that account holder must have a valid kyc done for example so there would be some sort of common logic which will be applicable to all of these right so that common logic so you have two options either you can write that common logic again and again in the savings account class in the current account class in the loan account class etc etc or you can write it at a central place and just refer it from there 
so that's where you will you will use abstract classes so you will create an abstract class of an account and then you will create these child classes under this account class which will be the savings account class the loan account class the current account class etc so this is a very lightning introduction to you about interfaces and abstract classes and class as we know is basically a concrete blueprint which holds data and logic together so here i table is an interface which will just specify that all the kinds of data structure which can be iterated which can be looped over should be present under this particular interface that's why we created this interface so under i table we have this collections interface and this will govern that everything which will present under the collection interface will be holding some sort of a collection of items now we look at the next set of interfaces we see a set interface we see a list interface and we see a queue interface when we talk about the set interface these three different types of interfaces represent three different properties of collection and these properties are exclusive of each other for example if we talk about set so set has a property that everything which you put into set will be unique it will never ever tolerate or contain any duplicate elements that's the property of set so now you can see whenever you have a scenario where there is a strict constraint that your collection should never have duplicates you will use sets when we talk about lists list is probably the most lenient representation of a collection it can store anything it can store duplicates as well it will not raise an error or a warning if you store same element multiple times it will happily store it but at the same time the list is basically an index based collection you can access the elements starting from the index 0 till the last element that's the basic value proposition so whenever you have a requirement where you want to access the elements into a predefined sequence and one by one then you should use list also the order is fixed here the first element will always come after the 0th element the second element will always come after the first element so whenever you iterate over this particular list you will never have a scenario where you do not know the order of the elements being accessed they will always be accessed in a predefined order so it's basically we can call it as an indexed ordered collection which can hold duplicates then the third one is queue here so queue is basically as you can this is basically inspired from real world so think of any queue if you if you go to buy something at a grocery store or if you go to buy a ticket at a at a railway station or you go to the check in counter at the airports so you stand in a queue and the concept of queue is that it works on a concept of first in first out the person who first went into the queue will be the person first being served and coming out of the queue and if the second person come that has to be standing behind the first person and once the first person is served and and goes out of the queue the second person comes at the front of the queue and that that particular person is served so you can see it's uh, if you have to store that kind of behavior or if you have to implement that kind of behavior in a java program then you would use queues so so this was about the top level interfaces which are set list and queue and out of these list and set are very very popularly used very heavily used in any kind of java enterprise grade application now there are more interfaces like sorted set navigable set and dq sorted set is basically forcing additional constraint on the set that the elements will be unique at the same time you can also have the elements into a sorted order that sorting can be an incremental sorting or decremental sorting that depends but the whole idea is that it will be sorted similarly navigable set brings another navigation kind of properties dq is basically a double ended queue where the elements can be inserted and removed both from the front and from the back so there are the different properties of these interfaces but like i said the most popular ones are these three ones now let's talk about the abstract classes so the abstract classes you see here are abstract collection abstract set abstract list abstract queue abstract sequential list generally you will not be using these directly you don't need to use them directly but you should be aware that they exist if you have a very specific case where you want to use these abstract classes 
you can use them in java program but most of the time you don't need to use them and most of the times you will be dealing with either the interfaces or you will be dealing with the concrete classes now this lecture is is getting a bit long so i will like to stop this lecture here so we covered about the interfaces part of the collection and we also understood a bit about the abstract classes though we are not going to use abstract classes in much detail in the programs in the next session we will cover the second part of this collection framework or the remaining part of this collections framework which is around the classes let's get started with discussing the concrete classes in the collections framework in the previous session we talked about the interfaces part of it where we discussed about sets the lists and the queues and we also touched a bit upon the abstract classes and like i mentioned earlier you don't need to generally use these abstract classes directly in your java program but you must be aware that they exist you see some arrows here right if you see if i just scroll up you see multiple kind of arrows here these arrows mean that if the arrow goes from bottom to top it means this particular element is a type of the parent it's basically a it de denoting a parent child kind of relationship so for example here you see tree set is basically uh, a navigable set and also extend uh, extends abstract set which extends set so similarly you can see all kind of uh, complex relationships here and generally you don't need to remember all of those you only need to remember the few and those few are basically easily can be spotted for example whenever you see a tree set it means it's basically a type of set whenever you see a word called list it means that it is a type of list and you all whenever you see a word called queue then it means that it is a type of queue so let's understand these classes let's first go to the list interface so you can see list interface has the relationship with abstract list and from there it goes down to array list abstract list has another child which is called abstract sequential list which is another abstract class and which has a concrete class which is called linked list so let's understand these two collections or these two uh, uh, types of list right now so when we talk about array list let's understand this we already have covered arrays so what are array list they are very similar to arrays in in a way that they are also indexed based collections so you can store elements and access them based on the index position starting from 0 going till the length minus 1 uh, index and this is an ordered collection you can access the elements only in a predefined sequence it can obviously accept duplicates as well and these all our properties are also applicable to arrays the differentiating factor here is that array list is a dynamic array it's not a static array if you remember when we talked about arrays we had to initialize it or we had to specify a fixed size of it while we initialize it once you have initialized the array size you cannot change the array size it is static it is fixed so if you have created an array of elements 10 and if you are trying to store the 11th element you are going to get an array of array index bound of exception but in case of array list it dynamically updates its size based on the number of elements stored you can still initialize it with some some initial size let's say you initialize an array list and you say that you want to initialize it with a size of 10 elements absolutely fine but the moment you you try to store the 11th element array list is going to dynamically update its size from 10 to something else so it will keep updating its size based on the number of number of elements which are coming to the collection that's the whole property of array list so remember it's it's used in the cases when you have an ordered collection to store and you want to access them based on the index and you want a dynamic update of the size the second sibling of it which is linked list is also a type of list but it has slightly different properties than array list in case of array list it was an index based collection you access the element based on the indexes but in linked list you access the elements based on the previous and the next element that's pretty much what it knows so an item can only be accessed in a particular sequence starting from head to the tail and when we talk about linked list the idea is that you have an element which will have a data and it will also have a pointer or a basically a reference 
that reference will be pointing to the next element in the linked list. Similarly, the next element will store the value, the actual data, and it will also store a reference to the next element. So you can see if you have to go to the fifth element, you cannot directly say linked list of five the way you can say this in array list because array list is an index based position uh, list, right? So you can access the zeroth element or the fifth element or the tenth element directly just in one line or one go. But in case of linked list, you cannot access the fifth element or the last element of the linked list directly. You have to start from the first element and keep jumping the references till you reach the last element. That's the property of linked list. So these are the two types of list. Now let's talk about the type of set. A type of set which is not mentioned here is hash set, which is a very popular type. So a set generally has two popular types, hash set and tree set. So let's talk about both of those. If I talk about hash set, the property is that it will inherit the existing properties of set, which is that element should be unique. That's good. But along with that, hash set will not remember or honor the order in which the elements are inserted into it. It will, if let's say if you insert 15 or 20 different elements inside hash set, and then if you try to iterate over the hash set, every time the order in which the elements are accessed and printed will be different. Every time the order of accession will be different. Every time the, the uh, way in which the elements are accessed, their order will be different. You, you cannot predict that. And that's the property of hash set. Whereas when we talk about tree set, in case of tree set, you can have a sort of fixed order and a tree hierarchy. So a tree hierarchy, if you know about the tree data structure from the data structure and algorithm section, you already would know what a tree looks like. Basically, it has a root and it has child. This is basically you can call this a tree as well, right? So whenever you have to store the values in a, in a tree fashion where you can navigate through the parent and childs then you would use the tree set. And remember, since it is a set, it will still inherit the uniqueness property of set. So that's about hash set and tree set. So we covered about list, we covered about sets. Now let's talk about these ones, which are vector, stack, and priority queue. So let's first understand about priority queue. So you would use a priority queue when you need a FIFO arrangement, but at the same time, if there are few elements in the queue, which cannot wait to be executed or processed when their turn comes. They want it to be executed on priority. So whenever you have such use case where you want to, uh, to maintain a FIFO fashion collection, but at the same time, you also want to allow few elements of it to override this FIFO arrangement and get processed ahead of their queue number. So you can use priority queue in those cases. Talking about stack, let's understand stack first. And stack is a LIFO arrangement, last in, first out. So remember in your house when you when you put plates, uh, the, the normal dinner plates over one, uh, one over each other, you are basically creating a stack. So the property is that the plate which is put first on the table will be picked up at the very last. And the plate which is put the last on the stack Let's say you put five plates on top of one, uh, one on top of other, then the fifth plate will be consumed first. Anybody would pick the plate from the very top. They will not pick the bottom plate because it's, it's almost impossible if you have a big stack, you cannot pull out the bottom most plate. The stack will fall down. So you will always pick out the elements from the top. So it has a LIFO arrangement. So whenever you have to create a last in first out kind of arrangement in your program for storing collections, you will use stack. Talking about vectors, vectors are very similar to lists. They're exactly similar. There is basically one major difference is that vectors are thread safe and lists are not thread safe. Now list has provided a way to be thread safe. We will cover that later. But for now you can understand that whenever you have a program in which you want to access a collection in a thread safe manner where two threads cannot modify the same element at the same time, then you will use vectors. So we covered about the complete collections framework classes, the interfaces and the abstract classes. And always remember the, uh, the reason why you will use array list or link list or a hash set or a tree set or a vector or a priority queue or a stack. That is the most important concept 
I want you to take away from this session. Let's get started with array lists in Java. So when we talk about array list, we are technically talking about a list. In the previous session, I covered in detail about the various implementation of list interface, which were array list and link list. And in today's session, we'll be focusing only on the array list. I have opened the API documentation of uh, the array list class. So if we just scroll down, we will see a nice description which is provided by Java. And it broadly covers all the points which I described in the previous session, which were that an array list is basically an array based implementation of a list. It's an index based implementation. So you can access the elements based on their index position. You can directly access any element if you know its index. It accepts any kind of duplicates as well. And by default, it is not thread safe. If two threads are trying to access the same collection at the same time, or maybe trying to modify the collection, then you will get inconsistent behavior. So that was about the basic description of array list. There are, it provides a lot of interesting utility methods as well for adding elements, for adding multiple elements, for removing elements, for fetching an element from the array list. And we will cover those methods in detail in the demo. And with that, maybe let's switch to the demo. So for this, I have created a class which is called array list demo. It has a public static void main method and it has an array list example written inside it. So at line number 10, you see that there is an initialization happening for the array list. And this is how you basically initialize the array list. To start with, you write the interface name. You can obviously write array list as well here. Instead of list, you can write array list. That is absolutely acceptable. But the reason I have written list here is because it is a better practice, or I would say it is a best practice to always initialize the concrete implementations with the interface type. I'm making a very generic statement, which is applicable to collections and at any other type of classes and objects you might be creating in your program. Always try to declare it with the type of interface and then define the concrete implementation on the right hand side. So the LHS or the left hand side will contain the interface declaration and the right hand side will contain the concrete implementation. The reason for this is that if tomorrow, if you have to change the representation of this array list to, let's say, a linked list, then you don't need to do a lot of work because the linked list is also a child of the list interface. So since list understands and knows about both of the classes, you can interchangeably use this reference to point to any of those implementations. That's why it is considered a best practice to basically uh, write the left hand side as the interface and the right hand side as the concrete implementation. That's the first bit of it. Second interesting thing you notice is this. So you see these expressions here and this basically encloses any kind of generics or class type. What are generics? We will cover this in detail in the upcoming sessions. For now, what you can understand and what you should know that these are denoting a class type of which the objects will be stored inside this particular list. So once I say list of integer, it means that this particular list is only going to hold integer objects. If you try to insert a string object, or if you try to insert a character object, or if you try to insert a float object or any other kind of object, it will create an error because it remember in the very first lecture, we said that Java is strongly typed language. It has very strong checks for these kind of data type mismatch. So if that's why it will expect you to specify the object type here and whatever type you have specified here, that's the kind of objects which are going to be stored inside this list. I have been using these terms called classes and objects inter interchangeably, but for now what you can understand that this is a type. How we, how we write classes and how we write objects and how we create objects. Again, I will cover this in detail in the upcoming sessions. So we have specified the list interface and I'm saying that this particular variable should hold any list of integer type. Then on the right hand side, I'm specifying what type of list this array list is. And this array list will be an array list class type. And again, I have to specify the class type uh, 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 specifications. And then I'm specifying a size here. This is the size of the array list. 
the initial size of the array list. You can obviously write it without this as well. This is also a perfectly fine statement in Java. And in this case, the array list is going to be initialized with its default size. If you specify a value, then the array list will be initialized with only that size. It is also considered a best practice to always initialize the array list with a some known initial value. Let's say if this array list is going to store only two elements and the default size is definitely way, way bigger than two elements, then you're going to waste a lot of memories. So that's why it is a best practice to specify, explicitly specify some sort of an initial size. This is also acceptable because it is automatically inferring the type from the declaration. You don't need to specify it again here. In fact, some of these modern IDEs will also show you a warning if you write it here. So the next thing I'm going to do is basically going to add some elements to this array list. So I've created an array list which should hold only integer values and it should hold to start with five values, but it will not complain if you try to add the sixth value. So for that, I have just written a small loop here. Let me just put curly braces around it for readability. So I'm saying int i equal to one, i should be less than or equal to five, i plus plus, and I keep doing array list dot add. So this add method is the method which is used to add elements to the array list. So whenever you have to add an element to the array list, remember you need to use the method add and then specify the actual element which is supposed to be added. So I'm adding one, two, three, four, five in this array list one by one using this loop. And then I'm just printing the whole array list. That's what I'm doing here. After that, to showcase another operation of this array list, I'm removing an element. And if you have to remove an element from array list, just simply called array list dot remove and specify the index from which you want to remove the element. Remember, you need to specify the index. And as I said in the beginning, this is an array based implementation. So this is going to start from zero. So when I say remove the element at index three, technically it's the fourth element of the array list. After that, once we have removed the element, I'm again displaying the modified array list and then printing all the elements of the uh, array list one by one. And for uh, for fetching the element, if you see here, if you if you observe this particular for loop, I'm using a couple of more interesting methods of the array list. Let's understand those methods as well, and then I will run the program. So here you see that I'm saying int, uh, int i equal to zero, and then I'm saying i less than array list dot size. So if this array list has a capacity, initial capacity of storing five elements, and I've just added five elements to it, then the array list dot size will be five, but it says less than. So it will start from zero and run till i equal to four, because the moment i becomes five, five is not less than five, and it will come out of the loop. So basically I'm trying to start this loop where i i's value starts from zero and goes till four. And here I'm calling another array list method, which is used to fetch an element from the array list. So whenever you have to get an element from the array list, just call dot get on the array list. So array list dot get, and I'm specifying the i value. So array list dot get of zero, get of one, get of two, get of three, and get of four. And that's technically the five elements which are stored in this array list. So let's run this program. So, and now let's observe the outputs here. Let me just bring the outputs down. Yeah. So at first I'm just printing the array list. So nothing, nothing, uh, uh, I'm just adding the elements and printing the uh, complete array list. So if you want to just print the whole array list, just put that inside system.out.print and the whole array list will be printed. That's line 17. Then I remove the element at index three. So if I traverse through this particular list, this is index zero, index one, index two, and index three. So index three has an element which has a value four. And I'm saying array list dot remove the element at index three. So this particular element should be removed from this particular list when I call the line 20. And then if I print the modified array list at line 24, I can see that four is gone now. It's only one, two, three, five. That's the remaining list. You also need to notice that whenever I call system dot out dot print ln with array list, I get this square brackets, which is the representation of an array list. If you don't want that, you might not want that always, right? If you want to print this nicely without the square brackets, then you have to iterate over the array list. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm going from zero to array list dot size, and I'm doing get of zero, get of one, get of two, and get of three. 
and that's how I get these values without for. We can also write the same loop using for enhanced loop. So let's say if I write for int i colon array list and then inside it I can just say system dot out dot print ln i and if I comment this particular loop for for a moment and run this program I see the values one by one because it's ln so every output comes on on a new line but you can pretty much see the same output if I remove this and if I write it like this just adding an extra space it will look a bit more nice a bit more formatted like this so as you can see that we can get the pretty much the same output either using a classic for loop style which is a bit verbose or you can use an enhanced for loop which is a much simpler and shorter and uh, less verbose way of doing exactly the same thing you don't even need to call the array list dot get i but i the reason i put this example because i wanted to show you the get functionality as well so that's all we are going to talk about in this session in the next session we will be discussing about link list which is the another implementation of the list interface let's get started with link lists in java in the previous session we talked about array lists and today we are going to talk about the another type of implementation of the list interface which is called linked list if you remember from the previous sessions we discussed about the properties of the linked list and all those properties are listed here as well so basic idea is that whenever you want to have a kind of implementation where the order of the elements is strictly maintained where the first element can refer to the second element the second element can refer to the third element and so on in those kind of cases you are going to use linked list another property of linked list is that you cannot randomly access an element directly as you as you could do in case of array list in case of array list you just say, you just write array list dot get and you provide the index location and you get the element right away that's not possible in linked list in linked list if you have to access the let's say the second last element or the fifth element in a 10 size element uh, list in that case you have to start from the head which is the first element and keep traversing till the fifth element that's the only way possible to access the fifth element or any random element so that's the property of linked list it is also not synchronized so if multiple threads are trying to access a linked list concurrently at least one of the threads and and one of the threads tries to modify the list then it must be synchronized externally by some other ways otherwise you will get unpredictable results and again this also provides a bunch of utility methods and we will cover some of those methods as you can see uh, add method for adding an element add all add first contains get first get last we will cover some of these methods in the demonstration which follows this particular documentation and with that let's jump to the implementation so i have prepared an example here for the linked list which is called linked list demo i've just created a class for it and we have created a public static void main method here and here you can see at line number 10 i have declared a linked list so this looks very similar to the way we declared an array list you see if you have noticed on the lhs i have wrote, i have written the concrete class and i have not written the interface reason being i'm using some concrete methods and actual methods which are only available in the linked list class so i am not looking at the reusability aspect in this particular example if you are then you have to add extra code for it but here i'm just writing linked list and again in this particular linked list i'm saying that i would only store string objects so that's why inside these braces i write string and then i say new linked list string again i have not specified the size so it will take the default size as per the jvm implementation now I have declared my linked list and it's time to add some elements to the linked list. For that, I have the method add, which is available in this linked list class, which will provide me with the capability to add elements. So at line number 12 and line number 13, I'm adding two elements. And if you remember, I told you that it works in a reference based implementation. So at first, an element A will be added. And when you try to add element B, element a's reference will be updated to point to b that's what will happen in this linked list and then at line 14 i'm using another interesting utility method of this linked list class 
which says add last what this method does that specifically it will add the element at the very end of the linked list so that was about add last and if i talk about line 15 i'm using another interesting method of linked list class which is called add first so what this will do that this is going to insert this element d at the very beginning of this linked list like even before a d will be inserted so whatever your linked list looks like whenever you call add first that element is going to be inserted at the very head of the linked list or the very beginning of the linked list linked list also provides another variant of the add method so there's one way to just add the string element directly because this is a string a linked list you can also add it based on the position so you can say add e at the second position inside the linked list so let's observe this output let me comment all the code below line 18 because we will be using some more methods here so we'll cover that in a while but let's first understand the output at line 18 if we run this program so right click run as java application and this is the output we get so let's understand the output or maybe let me do this let me put this here one by one so that we can interpret the output so i'm adding two elements and printing the list then calling add last and printing the new list then calling add first printing the new list and then calling list.add2 comma e and printing the list again so let's observe these outputs one by one i'll comment this and let's run this now so if i run this particular program the program till line 14 is executed because rest of the code is all commented let me comment this as well and if i run it again yes this is the output i get so at line 12 and 13 i've added two elements and i print the list there are only two elements and they are printed in the fashion a comma b everything is good here now let's uncomment this code and now i'm calling add last method and adding an element with string c which should be added at the very last of this particular list so let's see now what happens let me comment this one so that we only see one list at the output okay we see a comma b comma c so c has been successfully added to the end of the list now let's interpret this particular method which is called add first so i'm going to uncomment this and comment the previous sys out so now there's only one sys out here so i'm adding two elements adding c at the last and now adding d at the very beginning and printing out the list let's see what happens okay so the d has been added at the very beginning of the list even before a so now it looks like d comma a comma b comma c so far so good now let's move to this particular code and now i'm saying add an element called called e at the second position inside this list remember second position so let's run this list now this program now so now i see d comma a if you remember the previous output was d a b c if i just uncomment this for a while just to make it more clearer and if i run this program the previous list was d comma a comma b comma c and the new one says d a e e has been inserted at the position 2 so 0 1 2 position 2 has been added with this new string e and my list is modified now it's time to uh, uh, find some interesting operations about the removal so what happens if i try to remove elements from this list and then we will observe the output again so let's say if i say list dot remove b and so i'm saying just drop this particular element so you can directly specify that particular element's value and that element will be removed from the list and let's see what output do i get if i just call list dot remove b and i comment the rest of the code we should see a new output here which should not have b so running the program again yes so this was the old collection and this is the new collection from which b is gone because i've called list dot remove b now you can also remove elements based on the index position instead of specifying the element explicitly you can specify the index position and what happens if i call list dot remove 3 let's observe the output here as well so i'm just going to copy paste the sys out and we'll see what output do we get if we remove the element at third location okay so this was the previous output after removing b and if i call list dot remove 3 so 0 1 2 3 c is the element which is at third location and it is gone when i call list dot remove 3 c is gone 
and d comma a comma e is only remaining now let's try to understand this particular line which says list dot remove first expectedly this is going to remove the element from the very beginning so whatever element is present at the beginning it is going to remove the element and then we are going to print the list the modified list so we were here till dae and d was the element which was at the beginning and if i called remove first d is removed and now only a comma e is available and now i use another interesting method which is called list dot remove last and then i print the list the modified list so this is the list remaining and i am calling remove last so e should be dropped and only a should be left in this particular list yes we only see a here so this is basically what i wanted to show you in this program that we can perform different kind of operations using different methods like add add first add last remove remove first remove last obviously there are more interesting methods available in this particular class do check out the api documentation for it and there you can see all the different interesting methods which you can use while implementing linked list so this is all i wanted to cover in this particular session and in the next session we are going to cover an interesting framework class which is called set we are going to learn about sets in java in the next session let's get started with hash set in java if you remember i covered in the collections framework session that hash set is part of the set interface hierarchy and sets have a property that they keep the collections element unique if you try to add duplicate elements to the a set it will not accept that and it will still maintain the uniqueness property of the collection hash set provides some additional features to the set which is that in this case the elements would be accessed in a random fashion they will not be accessed in a fixed sequence rather they will be accessed in a random fashion hence the name hash set so if you read about this particular class in the documentation it will basically cover all the things which i just described it also accepts null elements if you want to insert null but why would you try to insert null that's the first question which you should ask it again provides similar kind of utility methods to the list interface collection hierarchy we covered like some utility methods to add the elements to remove the elements to check the size of the collection and to check if an element exists in the collection or not etc etc and we will cover some of these methods in the demo this is again not synchronized so this is not a thread safe collection which you should know so let's look at a demonstration of hash set and how do we actually create a hash set how do we operate upon a hash set using different utility methods so as you can see i have created a class here which is called hash set demo there is a public static void main method and then at line number 10 you will see that i have created the hash set and again it starts with a concrete class here which says hash set and you can obviously write it as set as well which will also work fine so we write the set type as string so this particular set is going to hold only and only string objects and nothing else and this set is basically a type of hash set again this is not mandatory so you can remove that it will still not complain and the program will run fine if you want to specify a size please do that if you do not want to specify the size nothing goes wrong and it will be initialized with the default memory footprint but remember doing this wastes a bit of memory so if you are running this program on a machine which is really tight on memory always put some kind of initialization size based on your knowledge of how many elements are going to be stored in this collection so after that at line number 12 we start adding elements to this collection and for adding the elements the method which is provided by the hash set class is add so you use the add method to add new elements so at line number 12 line number 13 14 and 15 i use the method again and again to add some elements if you observe the line number 14 and the line number 15 these two lines are adding the same element so i'm trying to add c twice to this particular hash set and we will observe the output to see what happens if we try to add duplicate elements in the hash set because if you remember the sets are supposed to be unique they should not be storing duplicate elements that's the property of sets so that's what i demonstrate by by adding duplicate elements to see how it behaves and let's do that 
let me comment the rest of the code for a while and let's run just this part of the code where I add C twice and I print the hash set and let's see what happens. So I go to run as and I click on Java application and I only see three elements. Even though I added four, I only see three and C has been added only once, not twice. Now you might be wondering whether this C is the C added at line 14 or the C added at line 15. So to understand that, we need to understand how hash sets add method works. So this add method is basically returning a Boolean value. If the element is added successfully, this add is going to return true. And if the element could not be added successfully, this add method is going to return false. So let's do that. Let's store the result of these add methods. Let's call this R1 and let's call this one as R2. Okay, and now we will try to print R1 and R2 and see what happens. So if we write system.out.println and I say R1 and then I just copy this after line 16 and write R2. And now we will observe the output of these to see which uh, when uh, we did the add at 14 and when we did the add at 16, which add actually resulted in C getting added. Did C get overwritten or did C did not add twice? What happens? So we see that uh, when we do the add at line 14, we get true. So it means that this add was successful and C was added here. And when I did the add again at line 16, this returned a false. It means the hash set rejected this add operation. So this C was not added. So the actual C was never overwritten. The original C was maintained. And when you try to add a duplicate value with the same value, a, a duplicate element with the same value, hash set is going to reject that. So that actually proves that the set will maintain the, uh, the uniqueness property and it will reject all the duplicates subsequently. That was about the add uh, property. Now let's understand another interesting property of the contains method. Contains method of the set class is used to find if an element exists in the set or not. So you can just use the hash set variable name dot contains and just type the actual element. And this is going to return true or false based on whether this element is present in the hash set or not present in the hash set. If it is present, then this contains method is going to return true. Otherwise, it is going to return false. So let's run this method and observe the output at line 21. So it says list. We are writing this particular string which says does list contain C or not? And it returns true because yes, my hash set does contain C. Now coming to line 23, I use another method of the hash set, which is the remove operation, which you can use to remove an element from the set. And then I'm again doing a sysout and I'm asking uh, the to print the set. This should be set and not list. So then I'm checking if uh, what happens to my hash set if I call the remove method and I'm just printing the modified hash set at line 24. So let's see what happens with the effect of remove operation. Okay, so after removing A, this is what remains in my hash set and A has been successfully dropped if I call the remove method. And then I try to just iterate over the hash set to show you how does this iteration work. It again works on exactly the same way. It has been working for the list implementations that on the RHS of this colon, you write the collection name, so hash set. And on the LHS of this colon, you write the representation of the element. So this hash set is going to contain string and this is just a placeholder. It can be anything. This is just a temporary variable to store the current value at the current step of the hash set iteration. And I'm printing all the items one by one. So if I run this, I'm able to print B and C because that's all which is remaining in this hash set. So this was a very quick demo to show you the functionalities of the hash set. How does hash set maintains uniqueness? How do you remove elements? How do you add elements? How do you check for an element's existence using contains? There's also a method to get the element of the hash set if you want to. So these are all the different properties and methods available in the hash set. And do check, it, check out the uh, API documentation of the hash set to learn about more methods. So that's all I wanted to cover in this particular session where we focused only on hash set. And in the next session, 
we are we will be discussing about tree sets and we will also see an example of how do we implement tree sets in java let's get started with tree sets in java so in the previous session we talked about about hash set which is one of the implementation of the set hierarchy and today we'll be focusing on tree set and if you remember when we talked about this collection framework i discussed briefly about tree set that the main reason you will use tree set is basically when you want to maintain natural ordering of the elements if you're adding your custom elements then you need to tell java how to compare and sort and order the elements but that's for another day when we'll cover about the uh, detailed comparable and comparator interfaces for now what you can understand that whenever you have to maintain the natural order of the elements automatically then you should use tree set along with that the set property still holds true that this tree set cannot have duplicate elements we should also know that tree set is not synchronized so it is not a thread safe collection so be be, remember, be aware that whenever you are trying to use tree set in a multi threaded environment you need to write more wiring code around it so that tree set works as expected okay that was about the brief uh, theory about the tree set you can read about uh, about it in detail in this tree set documentation class and with that let's switch to a demonstration of the tree set class so i have prepared a class here which is called tree set demo as you can see it has a public static void main method and at line number 8 i am initializing the tree set again it's again the standard representation of initializing a collection which we have been using throughout the different examples of the collections so tree set of string so this particular tree set is going to hold only and only string elements if you try to add another element it is going to throw a compilation error and the on the rhs i'm just saying new tree set and again this is not mandatory so i can remove that and it will still work you can specify the size whenever you know about the scope of the collection you should always specify the size for this demonstration it's a lightweight program so it's fine after that from line number 10 till line number 13 i'm again going to add some elements and again if you see i'm adding elements in random order i'm adding b and then i'm adding adding a then i am adding c twice just to show you the uniqueness property of the tree set does it still hold true or not we will be able to figure that out from this particular example and we will also see if i am adding b before a will it be printed in a fashion called bac or will it be printed in a fashion called abc we should also know that so let's try to run this program and understand the output so if we look at the output we see a before b but here when we added the elements we saw b before a we added b first and then we added a and then we added c twice and as per the uniqueness property of the set the second uh, addition statement at line number 13 returned false and set rejected this addition because it could see that c was already present in this particular collection so c is added only once but what's interesting is that b is added first but b is added b is printed after a so the natural order of the elements in this collection is automatically maintained by tree set so what under the hood tree set does here that it looks at the type which is a predefined type in java string is a predefined class in java so it will use its own sorting algorithm to sort the strings based on their natural order of sequence and in the natural order of sequence a will always come before b and b will always come before c so it will automatically apply that sorting and will present the result to you if you are using a custom class here let's say your own student class or your own customer class or your own account class in that case that account class or student class or customer class needs to tell java how to sort elements and for that you need to write comparable and comparator implementations which we will cover in detail in the future sessions but for now you you must understand that whatever the type of class you are specifying here should tell java how to sort the elements either java should know it automatically if it's a predefined class like string or integer or float or double then java would automatically know by default how to sort the elements but if you are creating a custom class of yours in the tree set and specifying that as as the tree set type then you should also tell java how to sort the customers whether you want to sort them based on their first name 
whether you want to sort them based on their age, their salary. Java doesn't know that. So you need, you need to tell Java about that if you're trying to use a custom class as the type in tree set. In this particular example, I'm using string here and it will apply the natural ordering. Let's put C here in the very beginning to see what happens. And I can comment this as we have already maintained and verified that C is only printed once and added once. So I'm adding C B A and let's run this program. I still get ABC because again, the natural order is implemented. Contrary to this, when we talked about hash set, remember I told that hash set is a random access uh, element collection list. So if you run the hash set, if you try to print the hash set again and again and again, you might see a different order. Sometimes if I use a hash set here, sometimes it will print ABC, sometimes it will print BAC, sometimes it might print CAB, any kind of sequence, any kind of random sequence, it will pick automatically. That's the property of hash set. But in case of tree set, no matter how many times you run it, you will always get the same order based on the sorting implementation available in the class type. So that's all I wanted to cover about tree set. Please read about, read about its Java documentation in the API docs to understand what all other methods and utilities tree set provides. But it's pretty much similar to what we saw in the hash set example, like remove or get, etc., etc., and contains, etc. So all this, all similar methods are available in the tree set class as well. And that's all we'll focus on uh, on this particular session. And in the next session, we are going to talk about an interesting framework called Maps. Let's get started with Maps in Java. So first of all, before we understand this particular diagram and the classes in this Map framework. Let's understand why do we need map? So there would be instances when you would write a Java program or any kind of program, there would be always be instances where you would need to store a key value kind of arrangement. A very simple example can be that you want to maintain a company database and you want to just bring the whole uh, mapping of the employee ID to the employee name into the Java program. How do you do that? you need a key value sort of arrangement where you can store the employee ID as the keys and each of the employee ID key would correspond to an employee name, which will be called the value. So you need a key and value arrangement in a Java program to store that kind of information and use that kind of information in your program. And that's where map comes into picture. Whenever you have to store a key value arrangement, remember you would always think about maps. Maps should be the right collection or the right data structure to be used if you want to store any key value arrangement in your program. So that's about map. And here you can see a nice uh, framework representation of map. And this is going to be a theoretical lecture where we will understand how this uh, map framework works, what is the property, and what are the different implementation classes?
Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.